as, as a troublemaker or a deceiver without having given him audience. It is the voice of Nicodemus as perhaps coming from Galilee and thus a natural sympathizer of Jesus. But as the author is keen to highlight, it is this Nicodemus who had gone to Jesus before. He has examined Words, the more thorough and comprehensive the investigation, the better. If a person is deceased and archival materials are lodged somewhere, then one would need to intentionally take steps to access them. For then one will be in a better place to evaluate secondary materials as to whether they are illuminating or not. It also helps. Um, if we are honest, to safeguard against manipulating material, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, to suit pre preconceived ends. Uh, you need an open mind, that's something else um, in approaching the subject. Not assuming we've already arrived um, at an understanding of the measure of the person, life and thought. Careful and thorough research may open up entirely new facts that lead to an entirely new <laughs> At the same time, it's important to read around and get a feel of the context and spirit of the age, particularly if somewhat removed from one's own. For otherwise, it would be impossible to judge how these persons fit whether they're the children of their time or innovators or a bit of both, as Smith was. Yet researching biography as an approach to answering a research question means that one should be careful not to lose sight of the main point in the investigation. Rather, it is the exploration of the person's engagement with the issue in question such as in my case, the relationship of primal religion with biblical religion that helps to define its parameters. It helps one to move beyond generalities, identify the materials that will be most useful in the biography, and focus the detailed study on these materials that are the most relevant for our purposes. A clear idea of what we are looking for helps to tease out the from the hate, as it were. So far, I've described the task of biographical research in a, for exploring a research question that focuses on one person exclusively. Another approach would be to make a comparative study of two or more persons, in which case the task of focusing relevantly for one's research questions would be more acute. For my own work, I did for a time consider comparing Robertson Smith with an early 20th century Old Testament and archaeology scholar, William Rob Rob Foxwell Albright, and even went so far as to visit the archives of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia that held some of his papers. But I soon discovered that a comparison would complicate the investigation. And as there was enough material in studying Smith alone, I abandoned the idea of a comparison. Kwame Badiaku's theology and identity is a clear example of entering into the lives and concerns of Christian apologists in two centuries and context far removed to draw out the analogies exploring different methods of approach to gospel and culture engagement. And in this way, he helped to set the pioneer African theologians clearly in the mainstream of Christian apologetics. So he thus used a highly focused form of biographical research to shed light on and do justice to Africa's modern theologians at a time when Western theologians 
were making negative comparisons with Western scholars. And in the case of Western evangelical scholars, often branding the African theologians as liberal, simply because they sought to engage with their context. Uh, John and Beatty suffered persecution in this way. Uh, and in uh, fact, Kwame had an interview with him in London. And uh, Mbiti said, you know, when he shared his insights, Mbiti said Kwame was helping him understand himself, you see, which was quite an affirmation. So in other words, uh, if you go by what Western scholars say, um, you can end up um, totally up the wrong creek. Louise Pirouet's study of black evangelists, focusing on the stories of the, of the Ugandan evangelist who pioneered the advance of Christianity in that country, was one of the first studies to dispel the myth of the prevailing mission narrative that gave undue prominence to the contribution of Western missionaries in the spread of the gospel in Africa. Yini Dorcas Da, um, closer to home, a graduate of ACI, has accomplished something similar for the women pioneer evangelists among her own people, the Burefo of Burkina Faso, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire, through the cameo biographies of significant Burefo women interspersed through her study. So whether we are studying one or many, there will still need to be extensive background research. Indeed, we shall need to have mastered far more material than will ultimately make its way into the thesis for the purpose of answering the research question. Consider theology and identity again, and the two extensive background chapters that preface each part. Kwame Badiako needed to be fully conversant with the background of each period and of each of the personalities he considered. Getting to grips with the second century context and their writings necessitated a study of materials in the original Greek and Latin, as well as some secondary sources in German. The fact that he would devote only one chapter to each of the apologists in question did not mean he could reduce the amount or depth the background study of either context. For the African theologians, he also needed French to take account of Francophone perspectives and produce a more comprehensive picture. So in other words, no shortcuts. We should also be aware in pursuing research on several individuals of the possibility of dead ends and red herrings. In my case, I eventually realized that a study of Albright alongside Robertson Smith would not be fruitful. Having spent, maybe wasted some months on that research, but that again is a hazard of PhD and master's study. It was suggested to Kwame Bediaku that he consider Athenagoras along with the other church fathers. But after again, after doing some work on him, saw that such a line of investigation was something of a red herring. He didn't really add anything to the picture. I've also touched on the language issue. And this becomes particularly significant for deep African biography. What is the mother tongue output of the personalities we consider? It was one of our own recent alumni, Joel Kubwimai's awareness of the substantial body of Kinyawanda material that Bishop Alois Bigirumwami had produced and uh, Joel's study of that material that ultimately determined in no small measure the shape of the biographical study that constituted the answer to his research question in his MTH dissertation. For it was determinative of the conclusions that he came to as to Bigirum Wami's unique contribution to the primal Christian engagement in Rwanda. 
It also revealed Bigirum Wami's pre- prescience as to the genocide that would occur after his death because of his unease that the Christian faith was not sufficiently rooted in the culture. What new things might come to light if we discovered the output in their mother tongues that Africa's writing theologians have produced? Uh, Kwame Badiako has sermons in the mother tongue that uh, Reverend Michael Bosman is investigating along with his English sermons. We are so used to the English or French output. Have we considered uh, that people might have preached and taught in their mother tongue? Even if it's not written down, there may be uh, audio or video recordings. It would be the task of researchers conversant in those mother tongues to find out if that was the case. Of course, the language factor becomes even more significant when considering the biographies of grassroots theologians. Biographical biography as an approach to a research question will invariably require the study of significant bodies of primary materials, as I hope I've shown up to now, whether in archives or field research. My experience does not include field research, so I shall confine myself to the task of archival study, uh, though aspects of what I shall mention here may well apply. Uh, Of course, we had uh, Dr. Maureen's excellent study yesterday on archives too, uh, which shows archives are a highly valuable source of primary material for yielding fresh biographical information and new insights. Therefore, one should approach such material without too rigid an opinion as to what to expect. An open mind is needed so that information and perspectives already gleaned from secondary sources can be corrected if necessary from the primary materials. Intuitions we may have about our person under study may also be confirmed or uh, refuted when we go to the archives. Official reports and published biographies have a way of glossing over conflicts, crises or blemished behaviour that readily appear in first-hand material. Uh, such as correspondent, personal correspondence reports and diaries and so on, especially when these are not likely to have been written with publication in mind. Such sources are a vital way of getting past hidden prejudices, uh, received assumptions or imposed structures in the life of a person. They may also prove to be a source of highly pertinent quotations which are capable of making a point in a more succinct or vivid way than a lengthy argument. As well as an open mind, we also need the mind of a detective, looking for clues to solve a puzzle or a mystery, given that no one's life is a completely open book, or to confirm or refute an intuition we may have. We shall need to be constantly weighing or sifting evidence coming to light through the archival records. Take note of what may at first sight incidental details. I've already given one illustration of this from Robertson Smith's sermons. If I had not spotted and taken the trouble to note down his recording of the dates and places where he preached them, I would have misled, I would have missed the vital evidence that helped me to reach the conclusions that rounded off my thesis. Often archival research, as we have said on earlier days, is laborious, it could be tedious, it may at, per, at first sight not appear to be yielding much information. So perseverance is essential for plowing through the haystack 
to discover the needle, or digging in a field to unearth the treasure, that eureka moment that was spoken about yesterday. Uh, Smith's sermons did that for me. Uh, and uh, it is it is a revelation. It is a it is a treasure. Archival material is different from a book in that it is not structured or organized into a coherent overall picture. It is therefore immensely helpful in approaching archival material if we are already clear as to the research sub-questions which can serve as the filter for shift, sifting through the mass of material. In my case, I was also looking for evidences of a Christendom perspective or departures from it, evidence of European views of other peoples, especially those identified as primitive, perspectives on primal religion in the Old Testament. Wherever and however these appeared, I would pay special attention to that material and make notes on it for further use. It's our task to interpret the archival material studied, to work out an overall structure and bring out its intrinsic significance in connection with the evidence already in hand in relation to our uh, research question. And I, I do expect that this attention to sub-questions applies to the questionnaires one devises for field research and to the classification of data elicited. So what are the outcomes we should expect from biographical research for answering our research questions? First, we should be prepared for surprises. No life can be pigeonholed into one compartment or another, given that each is a unique creation of the living God and conversely, all labels are in some sense artificial constructs waiting to be challenged. Researching biography is ideal for such a purpose. Further, biographical research is well positioned to reveal our common humanity around the world and down the ages in parallel responses to situations, questions, challenges. This was what Kwame Bediako discovered when he realized the viability of drawing an analogue between the work of the apologists of the second century Hellenistic world and that of the 20th century pioneer African theologians, while not neglecting the distinctly era-bound particularities. Robertson Smith was asking the kinds of gospel and culture engagement questions that we are asking in our time. But he was handicapped by the prevailing currents of thought in European intellectual and Christian circles. Biographical research done well should reveal both sides of the coin. And at a time when the language of scholarship appears to be getting increasingly dense and abstruse. Another outcome will be research conclusions that move away from abstraction and dry debate. For abstractions and dry debate do little to bring about change, whereas truth embodied in our life captures the imagination in a uniquely compelling way. The other day, I discovered um, a rather apt quote from Eugene Peterson in his book, The Jesus Way, A Conversation in Following Jesus. He says, impersonal, storyless talk and writing is a blight on the world of discourse. And I think that, that says it. Um, Indeed, story and incarnation have been the divinely chosen means whereby God has revealed himself in salvation history, supremely in Jesus Christ, and also subsequently through the lives of Jesus' devoted disciples 
through the ages. And it's interesting that our devotions each morning have somehow captured that truth. Incarnation is revelation. So to conclude, story is at the heart of the human creation with a narrative of fall and redemption and future hope played out in human lives. The living God is the author and redeemer, and the scriptures give us the divinely inspired narrative of salvation history and gospel message through which we believe and are saved. A biographical approach in research as a search for truth is ideally suited to keying into aspects of this ongoing story that may now be told for the edification of the church, the mission of the church, and the advancement in the advancement of the kingdom of God towards the consummation of that story at the end of the age. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Auntie Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. We are very grateful. Ed, you're welcome. <laughs> very, very grateful for this excellent uh, presentation. Um, we have been able to save some time and I want to make good use of it. So, are there any areas of seeking for understanding? Maybe some areas are not clear. So, we can look at those ones before we come to substantive questions. Uh, but Auntie Mary, uh, so if there are any questions, uh, I would like you to uh, to ask now. But Auntie Mary, let me begin by asking you to throw a little more light on what you meant by be aware of the possibility of dead ends and red herrings. Can you throw a little more light on that? Mary, be aware of what? You said be aware of the possibility of dead ends and red oh. herrings. Yes. Uh, well, you can you can start on a topic thinking that it is promising, and then as you go on, um, you real you come to realize one way or another that it is not um, answering. Well, it is it's not seeming to answer, or it's not likely to answer the research question that you uh, you have in mind in pursuing that research. Um, like I said, well, in my case, it was an issue of uh, comparison or not. Um, in the beginning, you know, when I kind of done an outline, I, I thought a uh, comparison between Smith and Albright uh, would work. Mm. It would help me with my research question. But then I came to realize, no, um, it's not going to advance anything. And in fact, pursuing Smith alone mm. was going to get me further. So that's what I mean by a dead end. Um, I mean, it'd be quite serious if, if, you're, if say, I started on Smith and then realized um, it, wasn't, it wasn't going to be yield. Um, of course, uh, one shouldn't give up too soon. I mean, like I said, um, you know, uh, you have, that perseverance is necessary. But so long as you you feel you are moving forward, then one should keep on with it. Um, a red herring, like, um, yeah, a red herring is when you, like, like Kwame Beliaku started on Athenagoras. Um, but it, it, it was going to lead him away from what he was... Um, researching on. So that's why he stopped that. It, it wasn't, um, it was, a red herring is when you deviate from your intended path. Something leads you off the track. Thank you so much. Uh, so please, um, if there are any questions for clarification before we move on to uh, yes. Who is speaking? Um, Pizza, Edward. Uh, hand. Edward, then uh, I've seen uh, Dr. Blasu. 
Edward, are you there? I've seen your hand. <coughs> are you there? Yes, please. Let's hear you. Yes, good morning, sir. Morning. Yes, um, I, I'm so grateful to God that I listened to um, our mommy this morning because I have a copy of a book right on my desk, on my table here. And when I read it, 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 it looks very difficult for me to digest. But throwing light on um, how he, she came about the topic and some of the highlight, highlights that she has given has given me a more understanding of what the book is all about. So I, I'm just bringing this out and I think I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm really, really grateful for what you have have heard this morning. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Edward. Um, Dr. Blasu. <coughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Sulis. Uh, uh, Prof. Mediaku, I will, I also want to have explanation on um, the point you made that. We should approach uh, such a task, uh, materials, with uh, a mind of a detective. Um, why so and how can we do that? Why? What do you mean by a mind of approaching with a mind of detective? Why? And how can yeah. we do that? What I, what I mean by that is you have sub-questions that you are interested in. Um, you've got your main, your main research question. And then you have uh, the breakdown. Like I, I gave the example of mine, the breakdown. Uh, Christendom, um, you know, the um, relation of uh, other peoples uh, to Europe, the, the attitude towards other peoples of Europeans. Um, the, the, these varied items, you know, the um, primal religion and Christian faith in the Old Testament, primal religion and um, revealed religion in the Old Testament. All the, those, you are, when you look at material, you see, if you go to, I'm talking about going to an archive, there's a mass of stuff in an, ar an archive. On Robertson Smith, there were boxes and boxes. Um, so, how do you begin? What are you um, you have these questions in the back of your mind and so you start going through the material and you are you're looking for clues that's what I mean by a mind of it clues that will um, lead you to an answer to your research question um, it helps you sift through material and, and you have, think, you, you know, you're looking for clues towards an answer. So that's, a, de a detective is looking for clues. He knows what, he, um, what he's looking for, and he's looking here for clues that will uh, get him there. Isn't that so? You know, forensic science and so on. You're, in, you're investigating, you're searching for clues that will uh, find the murderer or whatever. They will point you in the right direction. So, uh, so that's what I mean by a mind of a detective. In other words, you don't already have a preconceived idea uh, of, of um, you know, you, you know what you you hope to find, but your mind is sufficiently open to being uh, disproved. You know, your your hypothesis being disproved. Uh, and a detective has an open mind. He ought to. Uh, he's not trying to prove somebody. Uh, he's trying to find the guilty party. He's not necessarily saying, I think that person's guilty and I'm going to look for the evidence that shows it. When in fact, there's evidence pointing the other way. You see. So a mind of a detective and an open mind means that you are... Um, you, you have a clear idea of where, what you're looking for, uh, well, of, of, uh, of where you want to go, and you're looking for the, the pointers on the way. Does that, does that help? 
Sure, Prof. That was helpful. I think I get it clearer now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other interventions? Any questions for clarification? <laughs> or we come to the substantive matters. And I think Auntie Mary put it well. I was saying that be open for surprises. So, <laughs> so be open for surprises. Uh, any questions, please? Uh, okay, um, Jonas, I saw your hand. Jonas. Jonas, I saw your hand. Prof. Lai's hand is also up. Yes, uh, I, I, didn't, I, I can't see his. Uh, okay, Jonas, if you are not ready, I will give the chance to Prof. Lai. Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Sulisa, and thank you very much, uh, Aunt Mary. My, mine is uh, moving on straight to um, uh, comments and uh, matters of substance. I don't really have uh, questions of clarification. But uh, just to uh, thank Aunt Mary for opening my eyes to uh, the connection uh, between uh, biographical study and then resolving a key research in, a key research question. But when I saw the topic, I was wondering the direction it was going to head towards. But um, uh, listening to Aunt Mary, um, I think I'm beginning to understand my own research journey. I mean, I also happen to work on um, yeah. a biographical <clears throat> research. And yes. it was so helpful, I mean, listening to Aunt Mary. And um, um, it has helped me to understand um, something that she said from the beginning, particularly uh, the whole question of blood sacrifice. Uh, because I picked on some ideas from Ifemamu whilst researching on him that I quite didn't understand. Uh, he seemed to have rejected... Um, uh, the passage or the interpretation, the popular interpretation of the passage, uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Somebody interpreted this to say that is why Jesus Christ shed his blood you know, for the redemption of sin. And he rejected the interpretation. And I was wondering where it was coming from uh, until I read uh, Alex uh, Fraser. Uh, the mm -hmm. principal at the time at, at modern school where if I'm a movement. So you may have picked some of the theories uh, mm -hmm. or the whole idea of this ransom theory. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so I agree, I agree with you that um, uh, biographical research uh, helps us to focus. For the points you made, it helps us to focus. It helps us to avoid um, uh, going on, uh, if you like, a wild goose chase, you know, avoiding mm -hmm. all the extremes, uh, extremities and all that. And I, I wish that our students consider this uh, because they are quite, particularly in the African context, you have talked about um, Robertson Smith, but in our own African context, uh, uh, there are quite a lot of people who are, uh, as you rightly said, embodying truth in themselves. They embody the contradictions, the aspirations, and all that. And maybe in relation to them, we will be answering our own questions. So, so thank you very much. And I hope that uh, this paper is, is made available, uh, is published, so we can still continue yeah. to make your I, I was thinking, uh, I mean, it's almost ready for publication. Thank you. And um, I was thinking of putting it in the upcoming issue of Jack. Uh, which is navigating non-Western research methods. And uh, let, let me take this opportunity uh, to remind uh, faculty and interested students that um, there is a call for papers out for the June issue of JACT. We, ha we haven't filled all the slots yet, so uh, if, if somebody has something to contribute. Anyway, that's by the by. Thank you very much. 
Professor uh, Lai, thank you so much for your intervention. Uh, as um, Jonas, do you still want to say, uh, is your hand still up? Yes. <clears throat> yes, sir. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, okay. Yes. Go yeah, ahead. Mom. Mama, thank you very much for uh, helping me to understand my own journey. Um, it is very refreshing, and as a matter of fact, it takes a lot of uh, things that I did not understand before. Um, my query is with regard to the mindset with which um, you deal with all these um, um, biographies and seeking of evidence. Now, um, it looks like when you mention the fact that um, somebody must go in with um, um, detective mind and also um, have a predisposition in terms of what they are looking for. Um, when that is left without boundaries, it has the potential to cause the person to uh, wonder about, as you rightly said, and also... Um, being influenced by their own predisposition, in which case they may not get the objective view. So I was wondering if there are there is a way of setting the boundaries so that when you are looking, irrespective of what you are expecting and um, <coughs> the suspicions you have, and um, how, how do you set boundaries so that um, you remain within your research constraints, if I'm making myself clear? Um, I'm not too clear, but I mean, the, the, top, the, the nature of the topic you are working on, in a sense, sets its own boundaries. And it will vary for each person according to what they're working on. Um, you know, you, you have your topic, you have your research question defined. And then within that, as, as you begin to explore, you discover the sub-research questions that emerge. I mean, I, at the beginning, I didn't have any, uh, although I had my key research question, I didn't have the sub-questions. I, I had no clue about Christendom or uh, the European observation of other people's um, I, I didn't even think of the Old Testament in terms of um, a primal substructure, anything of that nature. Th those sub-questions emerged as I began to read, <clears throat> as I, be I began to see that they were significant for um, the exploration, for understanding Robertson Smith in relation to my research question. So, that, so that's what I mean, you know, as you, as you go on, um, the sub-questions, they're, they're what set the, the bounds, but you don't have those necessarily in the beginning. Um, I mean, you see, for me, Smith was an evangelical, right? <laughs> Even though his church eventually branded him as a heretic. The, the Free Church of Scotland was the evangelical wing of the Church of Scotland. Um, and uh, he was the professor in the Free Church College. Uh, his father was an eminent evangelical minister. Um, and he came to his own conviction, which we, he bears testimony to. So he's an evangelical. Um, he's not a liberal. So what takes him down this road of exploring issues that for the church are off bounds? Um, I mean, uh, you know, when the, he wrote an article on um, Semitic religion for the Encyclopedia Britannica, and uh, this is primitive religion, and it was discussed by the church uh, General Assembly, uh, one of the committees of the church investigating him. And it was such a shocking thing for them that this meeting was held in camera. Um, 
you know, so why, I mean, why, what takes him down that road of um, polarity with his church? And yet he's concerned for the church. He never leaves the church. And he preaches right through his career. Um, and as I said, I discovered the evidence that his later sermons were as evangelical as his earlier ones. So, um, you know, th this is, um, well, it's exploring the bounds and not assuming the church is right. Um, he, 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 his critique of the church was it was stuck in a Christendom mode. He wouldn't express it in those words, but that's what it amounts to. Uh, stuck in a Christendom mode and not realizing times are changing. A religious cultural plurality is impinging much more on European life than it ever, than it had for centuries. So how is the church engaging with that? That was his concern. He was an apologist for faith. His concern was to bring every thought captive to obey Christ. That's 2 Corinthians, you see. So I know that, so um, the, the bat, I mean, it's a long way around. Um, I'm exploring Christendom. I'm exploring relations, attitudes to other peoples, the history of that, the, this uh, strange attitude to the Old Testament, um, which doesn't like the sacrificial elements in it as primitive and so on. So where does all of that come and how, how does it play out? Um, and of course, my question is, ultimately, what is the relationship between primary religion and Christian faith? So I don't know if I've addressed, I've helped with a concrete example. Your own key research question, as you begin to explore, should throw up the sub-questions that then uh, prove determinative in addressing the material. Um, does that Thank you me? very much. Is it okay? I'm not sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Auntie Mary. Uh, Auntie Mori has a uh, has <laughs> Auntie Mori. Yes. Um. Thank you, Auntie Mary. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Nice, nice to hear from you. <laughs> yes. Very enriching. Very stimulating. Yes. I was wondering how long did it take you? Um you know, for the research. I, I know at a point you said uh, you ha you wanted to do a comparison uh, of uh, Robertson Smith and Albright. Then <laughs> after some months on that yeah. path, you realized that it wasn't going to be helpful. But altogether from start to maybe submission of your thesis, how well, long did it take? <laughs> yeah. um, the short answer is 15 years. But um, that, that the explanation of that is that okay. <laughs> I had three years uh, full time, and then Yao was born, and we returned to Ghana. Uh, but I, I brought materials with me. I'd, I'd already been to the archives by then. Uh, and then Kwabana was born. And then we began to return as they started school. And we were going back to Scotland for profs and lectureships in African Christianity. I that picked up the research again um, and built momentum in it uh, so that, uh, and I kept my status with the university by um, suspending and extending and things like that. Uh, you could do quite a bit of that in those days. I don't know, you probably couldn't do that now. Um, so that I eventually got there. I mean, it it, it was a work, an effort of great perseverance um, to keep it in view. But by the grace of God, I would I got there fifteen years later. <laughs> wow! It is a, you know I, I'm a I was a working studying mother. So um, yes. So what yeah. what would you uh, advise um, doctoral students, MTA students who have other things going on and uh, um, maybe discourage that is taking so long 
long and um, they're not not getting to yeah i mean i would say as much as possible uh, submit within you, maybe the allowed time yeah reduce as much as possible you cut out outside activities and you know the research should grip you so that it's always there if you like on the back burner if you think of a, a cooking stove of a back burner it's always there simmering in the back of your mind and you know you have a notebook in which if ideas flash into your mind you note them down so that you don't forget them uh, and you but you 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 know it, you need sufficient momentum all the time you know to get to the end i mean and and to avoid taking shortcuts which was one of the points i made uh, <clears throat> need deep deep res thorough research no shortcuts i mean those who have scholarships should not fritter their time away with other activities uh, it will be to the detriment of the quality of the final work uh, you know, obviously, if you ha if you're doing it part time, that's a different matter. But still, one should it, it should still be a, a such a significant priority that it's always to some extent in your mind, and you are moving forward um, in order to get to the end. So perseverance um, is is a, an, and patience. Um, yeah, patience, say if you've, like with Albright, I pursued uh, this, uh, what turned out to be a dead end uh, for several months. Uh, well, you know, you've got to pick up again uh, and pursue more, more focused on, on wh wh where you are now led. And of course, always there's the divine uh, for us. There's the divine strengthening. There's the um, there's the empowerment. There's the revelation. Um, I think finally, my uh, key research question focus um, came in, in the final, you know, the final um, uh, focusing of it that made that was the thesis came through inspiration. It didn't wasn't by you know, all the logical working out that I'd done with the outlines and so on, that had contributed, but they, it was a flash of insight that uh, finally determined the topic. So we, we also mustn't discount that. I mean, that is part of um, the process for those of us who believe and, um, and we have a testimony to that effect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Auntie Mary. <laughs> Can I respond to your call for papers and ask if mine will get in? <laughs> ask if? My paper will get in to be published, like yours. Um, yes, if, if you, uh, you, know the, you know the topic, and that navigating um, non-Western theological research method, methodology. Uh, so if, your, yes, your paper, if you um, fine tune it so that it addresses that issue, yes, by all means. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank yeah, you so much. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. In a couple of months. Okay, thank you. Nice to know. <laughs> well done, Auntie Mary. Are you cool? Yeah. I <laughs> thank you so much, Auntie Mary. Any question? Up. Uh, uh, also, like, do you still have something to yes. say? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, Aunt Mary said something in her presentation, uh, which I think is important in biographical research. Uh, she was fortunate to have loads and loads of materials that have been generated by William Robertson Smith. Um, and and the advantage with biographical biographical studies uh, or research as she has pointed out is that you 
uh, uh, are afforded wealth of material. And you should also uh, look out for materials, particularly materials that have been generated by the subject. Um, I recall that when I started my research on Ifrimamu, you know, at a point, um, I, I wanted to chicken out because all I had, and uh, for about two months or three months, was just um, a file, just a single file. That's all I had. And it was made up of uh, music manuscripts. Uh, of course, I couldn't write a PhD thesis just on a single file. But, you know, to cut a long story short, I, I was introduced to the li library of Rufimamu, and, you know, the rest is, is now history. The, the, the problem, uh, and Mary, um, um, with, with generation of materials and resources, particularly if you want to work on uh, biographies within the African context, uh, mm -hmm. where record keeping is a problem. Yeah. In fact, institutional record keeping is a problem, let alone individuals who have generated, you know, a lot of these materials. I mean, sharing my own experience, that's what I had to go through. I was fortunate because I, I dealt with a man who kept everything about himself. We want to, you know, research on, I mean, the leading lights within African, African Christianity. But you go out there, and uh, they are all scattered, you know. Um, I, I hear you saying perseverance, but what again would you say to African students who are all, you know, PhD students, MTA students, who may want to work on, on, on uh, biographies? Uh, kind of encouragement to them. Since within our context, these things don't come easy, as I've said. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yes, I mean, it, it is a different scenario from, from what I, I studied uh, from Robertson Smith when the, there was already a mass of material, although it wasn't all systematized. I mean, uh, you've got to search through the archives. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on whether the person is alive or dead, doesn't it? Um, if, um, or how close even if they are dead, if they are recently passed on. Um, presumably, there are those who remember. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, um, it, that, that's where, I mean, you've got to determine whether that you might, may have an idea that you would like to look at this person, but you've still got to find out, first of all, if it is possible, um, to get sufficient documentation of one sort or another, or if, uh, like I said, field research. Um, I didn't need field research. It wasn't, yeah, I didn't need it. But in the African setting, uh, it's very likely you will. Um, so it's important to see how, what that might yield. And then uh, if it, if a person is sufficiently significant, there may be mission records, I mean, uh, missionary archives uh, around the world. Um, but a lot of stuff on Africa is not held here, it is out there. Um, so it's important before one finally settles on a topic as, um, you know, you, uh, likely to answer a key research question, a, a biography, then one needs to make sure that uh, by dint of pursuing various leads, one will unearth some material. Perhaps there are others who have, who can also come in at this point and, answer, you know, who have more experience in the African setting, uh, who could sh shed some light on this question. Because it's an important one. I mean, it's yeah. about um, Dr. Wagi. Well, as you're in care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, I was reflecting deeply on that one, and and actually understanding more, even even as you you were citing earlier, um, the, the the processes and the experience 
uh, I went through in researching, especially spending those those times I thought were well, wasted times at at calling the libraries in London, Houston, London, and not coming out with much. But but I uh, just um my my comment is probably not directly related to the question you've ra just raised, but also uh, but many affirming the the importance of biographies and autobiographies. And it just struck me as I was listening to you and reflecting from yesterday's presentations by Koklu Lai as well as Maureen, how significant um, this, the, the, the biographies and autobiographies um, that we have encountered ourselves and benefited from, how helpful they are. And I'm just wondering whether we ought to perhaps um, suggest to not only theological and academic institutions, but also even churches, to consider biographies and autobiographies as an, as an area of ministry, so that churches, especially those that are well endowed, can assign certain members, either through an institution like SCI or, or even directly from their church um, uh, uh, pressings, sanction people to actually um, explore and investigate and write biographies of you know african um whether they are church people or statesmen or for the benefit that we have uh, already identified and continue to celebrate so seeing uh, this kind of uh, research and writing as a ministry not just an academic exercise where you get a, a master's degree or a phd degree but as a ministry of the church in terms of in practical ways Uh, I've seen a hand. Uh, who is this one? Trifu Elon uh, Agomensa. Yes, Agomensa, please. You have the floor. Uh, good morning. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mommy, for uh, this insightful presentation. Uh, I'm so grateful. Uh, actually, my question is directed to the first presenter, uh, uh, Dr. Gezi. I don't know whether he's around to respond to, to my question. Hello? My, Hello? Mine, was, mine was a devotional, not a plenary paper. <laughs> oh, okay. So I can ask questions on it. Okay. You, you, then... can, you can. You can ask, and we all reflect on it. But that's subject to the moderator, anyway. Oh, okay. And so, I'm not at the mercy of the moderator. If you, if you allow for those questions. Hello. Well, well I, I I guess I guess we should give room to those who have questions on the plenary presentation first, if there are there are others. Uh, okay. So so let's let's see. I, I've seen the hand, but I don't know the person. There's not no no name by it. Uh, and so can I, I ask my question? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, I I my hand. Could it be me? <laughs> There's a nearby doctor, uh, Professor Lai. Who? Oh. Ah. Okay. okay, yes. Papu Lai. Okay, thank you. Um, Papu Lai. Yes, sir. I'm here. Yes, please ask your question. And after okay. that, and that will be it. All right. Thank you, Auntie Mary, for the paper. Um. I think one of the things that sometimes we do not consult in the Western world, they have directories and bibliographies that compile special collections. We do not seem to have that in our libraries. Um, so it leaves students wondering and going all over the place, wasting precious time to locate material and i hope that with time and um, institutions all our institutions that are represented on this platform will make it a point to 
um, at least put together documentation on their holdings so that it helps um, you know students. We can even do that at individual levels. If you know somebody who is versed in a particular field, then we can follow up, put down the person's name. It involves a lot of networking and informal discussion. But without that, we can't go anywhere. So formally, the institutions should ensure that they document what they have and then individuals too should be willing to network and give information to others in their fields. That is my little submission. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Kokli. Uh, it's it's an important area, and, and I endorse your your recommendation. Uh, and I remember when you were at ACI, uh, we had a few issues of JAT where there were bibliographies like in gospel and culture and so on. Um, it, it Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but can, I just, can I just pick up on that um, uh, in relation to my own experience? You see, uh, my, my work, uh, I was exploring in a sense a pioneer area. I mean, only uh, Harold Turner had, uh, he got together materials um, and written a few seminar articles and, and books and so on. But there wasn't really uh, much else in terms of the field I was exploring because it was an interdisciplinary. I was bringing together uh, Old Testament, European, um, cultural, history, Christian history, and so on. And so I had to build my own bibliographies. Um, uh, that's how I started out. That's one of the first stages of um, exploring the field. Uh, we, 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 we need, we want, because each subject that we are pursuing, each key research question, in some sense, is unique. We have to build our own bibliographies. So that, that I, be, I began, you know, um, you, you, have, you find one book, uh, article or whatever, which is of key interest to you. You look at the bibliography and you see what's in there that you could also <coughs> explore. And so you make a list of these things. Uh, you know, you, you, so you build biographical, bibliog uh, bibliographical lists, uh, again, according to the sub-questions. Like I had one on primal religion, I had one on Christendom, I had one on primary religion and Old Testament and so on. Uh, the, uh, one wouldn't have found a bibliography on those particular topics anywhere. So uh, um, even though I agree, you know, one should, um, one should be providing some of the basic bibliographies, in, particularly in, in, our, in our fields, um, gospel and culture, primal Christian spirituality, Christian history and mission history and so on. They are key subject. Well, we, we already have a basic biography, uh, bibliography for our, our courses. But beyond that, uh, going into more detail, one could do more. But uh, it's still, for a PhD student in particular, uh, and MTH on a lesser level, you do need to build your own bibliography according, again, the bounds set by the key research question and the sub-questions that emerge. So uh, that's my response. So I, it's an important point you've raised. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take the last one and then we'll go for a break. It's too like a yeah. Yes, Dr. Miller. Can I go on? Yes, please. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, qu quite fascinated and um, have learned a lot uh, from what uh, Antumari has put forward. Now, the issue I have, I noticed the whole question of making sure that you don't go into this um, biographical uh, research with uh, preconceived um, ideas. This is very, very important. I, 
I always have had the feeling that uh, when uh, some people go for this, they go to prove a point or dis disprove a point uh, uh, or mere curiosity and whatever. But the outline as given by Auntie Mary, I think it's something that um, I have learned a lot, I'm sure others also have done. My own thinking is this, since Auntie Mary has done this and uh, Laie has done this, I know that there is this proposal of uh, coming out with a publication on, on this paper, but is it possible to provide a guideline, a guideline that will help students of ACI who want to, who will want to embark this? To be clear about the go areas, no go areas, the whole question of objectivity, so that they do not just go there to prove a point or disapprove a point. Is that possible to do that? Yes, Auntie Mary. Yes, you are clear. Mm. Yes. Um, I think at this seminar, in a sense, he's contributing to uh, uh, Alison, you know, Ralph Howell. Oh, yes, uh, if I could just respond to uh, yes, um, sure. Dr. Mbilla's uh, uh, request. Uh, in the research methods seminars, um, particularly the segment on gospel and culture, but also in the historical section, we have an entire segment on the issue of objectivity. Um, and that has been repeated year after year after year in our teaching in the research method seminars. So sometimes it's a very deep frustration to me when I see students presenting at their topic presentation uh, sessions and then in their first proposals, um, a work which, in clearly uh, indicates that they already have a bias in their research um, and that they are trying to prove a point. Because in the research methods seminars, we, we actually have a whole segment of one thing discussing the issue of bias and objectivity. So it is raised within the, you know, the research methods seminars at ACI. Thank you, Professor Allison, for the intervention. I think our time is up. So, Auntie Mary, if you want, we want to say something before we, we say goodbye. No, I think I've said my piece. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll go for a break now. We'll come back at 11.15. So, let's go for a break now. Come back at 11.15. Auntie Mary, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're right. Robert, if you are there, you can have, you can ask your question during the break. <laughs> hey, ancestor, you only <laughs> you 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 work you work in between. <laughs> well, like this this morning has been a real stretch. <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> you know, we are oh, also, you know. the two slides. Yes, Abraham. Oh, are you intertestamental prophet? Yeah, yeah, he is. I tell you. I tell you, he works, he works in between the testaments. <laughs> yeah, so he only, takes, he only oh. takes questions. But you, 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 might, you might be usurping John the Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm enjoying. Good morning, Dr. Uh, Wagi. Oh, good morning. Good morning, uh, 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 Brother Oluwodare. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, you? Yesterday you, you, you gave me some flavors. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> catfish soup. Thank, thank you for your questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah. but, but Rudolf, Rudolf, oh, you, the question is for you all. Which one? 
I think you had the flow with your with your enquirer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think he went on break. Oh, I, I see. thought he was still on. Mm. Oh, okay. I wondered what question he, he was going to ask. For. I didn't intend to receive answer questions from the <laughs> devotion. <laughs> <laughs> hey Rudolph, well you. done, oh, well done, Rudolph. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've told him to come and see you, Nicodemus. <laughs> yes, right there. <laughs> are, are you are you still in Enugu? So much. Ah, it's it's good you experience the glitches yourself. <laughs> yes, I'm in Enugu. Who's that, please? Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah. Who's that? It's Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Mm. Yes, Jeremiah. I am. And you, where oh, are you? I'm in Lagos. I'm in Ipaja, mm -hmm. Lagos. Ah, okay. Eku yeah. Lagos. Oh, oh Hashima. <laughs> <laughs> Abraham, if you're still there, why don't you ask uh, Professor Laye about um, the biography? Um, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Our recording lives because I think ACI had a project like that in the past. Okay, um, so, so Hello? Maureen, I, I think, yes, yes, at Maureen. Yeah, I'm saying you can ask Professor Laye about um, recording the lives of, um, you know, doing biographies. There was a project at ACI some time ago, oh, which yeah. he was coordinating. They were doing video interviews of some Christian uh, leaders. Okay. So you can ask him about that. Uh -huh. Yeah, because it seems, if, it seems and I will, I will indeed. If, it, if it's altogether abandoned or he's going to revisit and they revive it. Yeah, I, I don't know whether Prof. Lai is still on. Maybe he could respond to that. Yeah, um, you, you can ask him privately. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. I put it in the test, please, but maybe he's not ready to ask him. Sure, sure. I hope you're fine, Claire and the children. Yeah, by God's grace, yes. Um, Claire is um, she she helps out at the school for two or three days a week, so she's gone there now. Um, right. But Leslie's class, they've had to stay at home because two two girls in their class tested positive, so they've all oh. had to to withdraw again. So, yeah. but but it's only until tomorrow there, and then it's midterm. Okay. Yeah. Well, better to be safe than sorry. No, that's why. Right. Sorry about that. Indeed. Oh, thank okay, you. Okay, I'm going for my break now. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Anna Tomorin. She has gone for her break. Hello, oh, who is yeah. that calling oh, me back? Sorry. <laughs> Kedu, Kedu, is that Dr. Blasu? <laughs> no, it's Henry Obley. Uh, Henry, do I know you? People. Greetings to Enugu people. Because you mentioned they receive them all. They receive them and send back to you. Because you mentioned Enugu, I said Ndewo. Ndewo. Although Ndewo is not an Enugu language. <laughs> oh, is it? Is it uh, uh, Oweri? Yeah, uh -huh, it's Oweri, <laughs> yes. Onicha. <laughs> not Onicha. <laughs> Kedu? Kedu. Yeah, fine, that's better. Yes, Odima. <laughs> all right. Good job, man. Okay. okay. So, Jeremiah. Yes, sir. Are you at Yanaipaja or which one? Yeah. Yanaipaja. Wow, you. Ipaja. Oh, Yanaipaja is uh, the express road, but yeah, Ipaja yeah. is town. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. you see, uh, Jeremiah, when you start mentioning these places, eh? Yes. I can taste the flavors in my mouth because those are the places we stopped and then Victoria Island for some special tantalizing uh, Nigerian delicacies. So I can, wow. I can wow. test them. <laughs> wow. you, in fact, the way you pronounce them shows that uh, you have been there and you have drank, you have drank from the water of the soil. Absolutely. So we, yes. we, went, we went to one place um, uh, around the corner and they said, you catch your fish, put your finger on your fish, and we will cook it for you. The fish, oh, okay, the fish is, was, it was still alive in the drum. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's catfish. Catfish, yes. Yes, they are so numerous. Yeah, so between um, artificial 
uh, growing of uh, um, catfish. That's uh, right. It's so it's so abundant here in the, in Lagos. That's right. You know, it 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 was it so happened during a time when I was reading um, the trials of Brother Jero. Okay. And th that scene where where um, the uh, the apprentice is talking about um, Chume is talking about playing trumpet trumpet with indigenous tunes. Okay. But the captain, this is Salvation Army, the captain wanted him to play pure notes. Okay. So he says to the captain, ah, now you want me to play sand sand tunes. Nasup, nasup, you don't need sand sand soup. You need pepper inside. You know, <laughs> gong, gong. <laughs> you, need, you need a very serious... Uh, 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 <laughs> that, that will uh, make the soup. <laughs> Uh, uh, you need, you need, you need guam You need is it goody goody? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. So, so, so I said, you are at Oxford. Who is that? I said Jeremiah. I said you are at Oxford. No, no, we are still in Liverpool. Liverpool, okay, Liverpool. Yeah. For me, I, I was, I was taking a bath because for him is a Yoruba. And of course, uh, professor. Um, so I was like, I, and I began to see the value of ACI. You right. know, where we are put everything, uh, all of the uh, spiritual world and yeah. the physical world all together in our learning. And um, so uh, it's something that we look, I would like us to explore. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just show you, um, just uh, the last week, I, 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 this book came, um, okay. can you see it? His article, Researching and Writing Christian Biography in Africa, a challenge to evangelical studies in global context, Watson A. Omolokoli laments the general lack of biographies of Christians in Africa. Such biographies he contends would be of great help to contemporary African Christians. Said he, much benefit would accrue to us as a result of interacting with the lives, activities, and overall operations of such people. The example of their lives can readily serve as useful models for us in our own Christian pilgrimage. The recurring lessons which the total picture presents can provide a lasting challenge and an inspiration to all who come across their biographies. Omulokoli's concern needs not to be debated, for clearly the path of biographical writing for teaching purposes has been laid down for us by our forebears in scripture. Beginning in the book of beginnings, that is Genesis, in which biography is used to present the story of Abraham, the proto-man of faith, together with his progeny, Isaac and Jacob, Several instances are presented in which the biographical journal is used as a tool to teach positive and negative lessons to people of faith. The books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles are clear examples of this method of education. So First Chronicles chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, to summarize the life of Saul as follows, and there's a quote. Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance, and he did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse, unquote. And Jehoshaphat's life would be summarized as follows. And there's a quote. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. In everything, 
he followed the ways of his father Asa and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed, and the people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Jehoshaphat was also at peace with the king of Israel. He rid the land of the rest of the male shrine prostitutes who remained there even after the reign of his father Asa. Then Jehoshaphat rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David, his father. You can see this from 1 Kings 22 and verses 41 to 50. Now, similarly in the New Testament, the Gospels and the Book of Acts contain the stories of Peter and Paul, through which we see their trajectory of faith and that of the early Christian community. Clearly, these accounts are not formal biographies in the way in which we know the genre. They are selections of incidents in the lives of the persons presented such that lessons may be learned from them. A good biography from a Christian perspective then should be purposeful. In more modern times, older evangelicals of Ghana may be familiar with God's Smuggler by Brother Andrew with John and Elizabeth Cheryl, which is the story of brave Brother Andrew who smuggled Bibles into communist lands for Christian edification and discipleship. They may also be familiar with Corrie ten Boom's biography, The Hiding Place, which is a story of a Dutch family who hid Jews from the Nazis during World War II and their own experiences in a labor camp when they were found out. In contemporary times, one can mention among many, Brother Yun's The Heavenly Man, which amid other things, tells the story of Yun's escape from a Chinese jail where he had been imprisoned a third time. God worked the miracle of Acts chapter 12, in which Peter walked out of prison without being seen in Brother Yun's life. He also walked out to freedom. The story further tells his suffering and his passion for the spread of the gospel in all the world, especially in his home country of China. The purposeful nature of good Christian biography is once again brought up. Now, as Omurokoli laments, biographies of Christians who stand out in Africa are very few. And some of these who could be an inspiration to the body of Christ die before they can share their story. The challenge that goes out to contemporary Christian scholars to take up the challenge of writing Christian biographies for purposeful Christian ministry in its own right or as part of a larger work such as a dissertation or a thesis. How does one begin, one may ask? The answer, as characterizes all scholarly historical activity, one has to think about sources for research. For clearly, the task is not imaginative. It is not fictional writing. Before we consider the issue of sources, we need to mention that we will use as foundation the research and writing we engaged in as part of our thesis, and the title is there, The Role of Indigenous Lay Agents in the Expansion of Methodism in the Gold Coast before 1950, with special reference to catechists and quotes. Now, whilst researching into one aspect of the role of indigenous lay agents in the expansion of Methodism in the Gold Coast, I had to tell the story of the prophet Samson of Rome. So I will use the research activity I engaged in as background to the principles one needs to apply in researching and writing biographies, especially as it relates to a research problem. This paper thus will focus on the use of resources 
as well as the issue of interpretation in Christian biographical writing, have tried to be as detailed as possible to help the beginner in research appreciate the challenges and experiences that one may go through in the process. So sources. Sources can generally be characterized into written and oral. Written sources may further be subdivided into primary and secondary. A primary means documents that have survived the period in which the history occurs. Authentic biography from written sources can only be composed when these are primary or as close as possible to the events being described. The same may generally be said for historical writing. Secondary sources, on the other hand, may be described as documents which are based on primary research and sources. Most researchers would find that some others have tried to plot the path they are about to take in some way, even though possibly not the very same trajectory. A good literature review thus helps the biographer become familiar with the territory related to the subject of his research. They may even find that others have written on some aspects of the person they are focusing on. Consequently, they are able to focus better on what apparently remains to be done and or correct misconceptions through the current research. That's a very good story. Now, oral sources, contrary-wise, have been severely debated as to their authenticity. In the absence of sufficient written sources, they may be used when the necessary precautions are observed, or they may be problematic. Oral sources may be categorized into two, oral tradition and oral history. Oral tradition, and I'm quoting, is usually defined as the recollections of the past transmitted and recounted that arise naturally within and from the dynamics of culture, unquote. They are often entrusted to chosen individuals for safekeeping and for transmission. Consequently, the keeper of oral tradition needs not be connected to the experiences they narrate. Oral history, on the other hand, and I'm quoting, is usually defined as a purposeful and deliberate effort to directly elicit the past experiences of people, unquote. It thus uses recording devices such as audio or video. Now, as hinted to above, by their nature, oral sources tend to lack precision. They are selective. They may not accurately give chronological detail. They may also modify the past to suit current circumstances. Then because they rely on memory, they may also not be reliable. Consequently, they need, if possible, to be verified by other mechanisms. Despite these and other shortfalls, oral sources may be the only sources available for an oral society and they naturally remain one of the few paths towards clarifications or authentications of information which exists as written documents. Now, written sources on Prophet of Pong. In my research, I found that I needed both written and oral sources. For scholarly work on Prophet Samson of Pong was minimal. Indeed, his person remained an enigma in the Christian history of Ghana, existing only orally among some Ghanaian Christians until some attempts were made by two scholars 
to unravel his story. This was because the first recorded history of his ministry existing in the official history of the first 100 years of Gold Coast Methodism naturally presented only a summary of this. In addition, the successful marketing strategies used by the church ran out copies of the publication in a short space of time. It was thus left to scholars Hans W. de Brunner and G. M. Halliburton, to whom he granted interviews in 1957 and 1964 respectively to give more details of his phenomenal ministry. Strangely, it appears that both did not begin to publish their findings on Opong until close to or after his death in 1965. One can surmise that De Brunner delayed his writing and publication till 1963 and 1965 respectively because he did not believe Opong was a man of God to be emulated. He appeared to have somewhat gone along with Reverend W. Schaefer Basel missionary at Doma Ahinkro at that time. Now, Reverend Schaefer ministered in the same area that um, Prophet Opong did during parts of Opong's ministry. Now, Schaefer believed that Samson Opong was nothing more than a great fetish priest. Nevertheless, De Brunner proved true to his vocation as a scholar by presenting as accurately as possible the information he got from him in his personal interview of the experience of his ministry. His interpretation, though, was different from many others, but we shall return to this theme much later. Alibertin, on the other hand, was more benign towards Opong. He probably did not go beyond the two articles he did because he was working on his massive study of the similar personage, William Wendy Harris, the subject of his thesis presented at the University of London in 1966. This was about the same time that Opon died. Now we need to remark, though, that the official Methodist chronicler Arthur E. Sutton's statement carries a lot of weight. Since he visited the Gold Coast in 1929, the same year that some sad incidents concerning Opong and his fall from Greece were reported to the Gold Coast Methodist Synod. Now, the visit was to participate in a conference on the production of literature. And it was not until 1933, that's four years after, that he was invited to write the history of the Gold Coast Methodist Church, which was published in 1934. Nevertheless, there is no reason to underread his testimony. The time lapse between the events and their record is so short that it makes his statement trustworthy. Now, with these three very primary sources in hand, the way was open for me to assess whether I could use the material to answer my research question. Remember, I was seeking to find out the role of indigenous lay agents in the spread of Methodism in Ghana. To be able to do this effectively, I realized that I needed more information on Opong's ministry content and strategy which the sources I had did not fully document. Since the only written records on Opong appear to be the three sources already mentioned, the way forward pointed clearly to oral sources. But there was a false source which I chanced upon through the method of cross-referencing. So let me explain cross-referencing. And before we, we do this in detail, we also need to explain the value of it, that is cross-referencing. That is following up on documented primary sources of earlier 
the secondary writers which appear viable. This I did with the testimony of Reverend Shiva, remember him? Reverend Shiva on Opong, which De Bruna indicates he obtained from a lady, Katesa Schlusser. Clearly, this source was very significant. Since Schaefer lived in Doma and Yukro, the same area as Opong did during part of his ministry. Now, Schlusser's work was not in the Johannes Zimmerman Library of Akufi Chrysler Institute nor through internet and other searches in any of the university libraries in the country. The only viable alternative left was to search through the libraries of other Western universities through the internet. Providentially, I cited one in Edinburgh University Library where my niece was working on her doctoral degree. Through her, I managed to scan the relevant pages. Unfortunately for me, however, the document was in old German. So I had to get a translator at the Ghana Institute of Languages to transcribe it into English at an expensive cost. Now what about secondary sources? The nature of the research being conducted dictated that I move away from these in the case of the story of Samson. This was doctoral historical research, and I needed to validate my work with as primary a document as possible. Further, I have already indicated that for biography to be authentic, one needs to use as many primary documents as possible. I was able, by God's grace, to access the main primary written sources that were discovered. There was hardly the need then for secondary sources. By way of reminder, I have to reiterate that I needed to do further research because the material available could not help me solve my research problem. Now, the way forward, therefore appear to be oral sources. More general sources naturally related to the period and context of the research were however consulted so that one could situate the story properly. So oral sources on Prophet Opong. Samson Opong's village was a continuum in the Doma state of the Bono region. So I had to go there. Knowing his connection with the Methodists, I sought to find out the nearest Methodist church. Providentially, but perhaps not too surprisingly, there was one in Akuntenim, and even with a resident minister. This made my work so much easier as I could reside in his house and use him as my contact person. He himself, had used Prophet Opon as the subject of a required essay as a clergy probationer of the Methodist Church. So he knew key people I could interview in the village who had the requisite information. Among these would be J.K. Okra, a distant relation of Opon, who was then the custodian of Opon's house and his paraphernalia as a Christian prophet or evangelist. Okra gave me access to Opong's ropes and photographs and also showed me his bedroom. Later, I was led to his grave, on top of which the Methodist Church has now built a mausoleum. I've already mentioned that oral sources have to be used with care. Some of the stories which were told me about Opong appear too good to be true. So I did not include them in my history. It is true that I had to make decisions as to what to include and what not to include. In the process, I was careful not to overstate my case for the clearly supernatural and prophetic type of ministry upon appeared to have. Now, in this way, 
I avoided her geography. For as Walls has noted, and I'm quoting him, her geography we have in abundance in African church history. And her geography, like mythology, is a valid dreary genre. But again, like mythology, it is poetic, not a scholarly category, unquote. Unfortunately, I could not access some of those uh, stories for this paper, the stories that appear to be, to be true. Now, what method did I use to document the oral sources? I used a recorder. But at the same time, I wrote down the oral testimony in tree as fast as I could in English. Later, I transcribed the recorded material directly into English. On one occasion, an interviewee used the Bono language, and this sounded like tree. So I thought the lady had a speech impediment. It was only later that I discovered that she had used a different language. Naturally, I could not get too much from her since I do not speak. I speak tree. Now, in my work on indigenous agency, I had to tell the story of the other major Christian prophets in Ghanaian Christian history. That is William Woody Harris. But I did not need to do further research because Gordon M. Halliburton and David A. Shank, together with Sheila S. Walker, had among them unraveled his story using very primary documents. And this was quality research. For contemporary eyewitness accounts from the people who still remembered the prophet during the time of research, as well as the reports of missionaries and government officials of the time, had made it possible for a good historical account of the life of the prophet to be formulated. What I did, therefore, was to do only a summary and an analysis of their historical work as it related to my theme. Because of this material and um, that it was available, I could do some comparisons with the open story as far as my theme of the role of indigenous agency was concerned. Primary sources need not be only written or oral. Artifacts from the period could also serve as very authentic sources. I have mentioned that I had the privilege of interviewing the custodian of some sort of Pons paraphernalia. He gave me access to a number of these, upon preaching and other grounds, his photographs, and a small white stone from which upon had been given the power and gifts of reading scripture. These did not add directly to the story, but they served to validate it. Now we move on to the other area of interpretation. A little theory first. The subject of interpretation occupies center stage in historiography, for it relates to the purpose of the discipline. Why study and write history? There appears to be two main schools in the matter of historiographical interpretation. Two schools, secular and Christian. The secular Christ, uh, historians take, among others, Thucydides of the 5th century BCE as their ancestor. They, and I quote, they regard human reason as the key to understanding the past, unquote. The record of past human events is held to have an underlying purposeful thread, and one can discern these purposes through human reason or rationalization. As F.C. Bohr would say, and I'm quoting him, history is a movement of an idea to its logical end with its different aspects, unquote. The early historians of this school strangely reaffirming Jewish belief, focused on the need for history to teach moral lessons, believing that human failing, or Christians would say sin, was the cause of the human condition. 
Learning from the study of the past, therefore, would teach human beings to act more wisely and avoid the mistakes of the past. They were thus moralists by inclination, a position they share with Christian historians. Or these also would wish that their histories serve a dictative purpose. Consequently, Christian scholar Omulukuli would say, the lessons learned from the biographies of these luminaries of the church will inspire and challenge many an eager Christian to fuller commitment and devotion to the demands of the Christian faith. In an age where outstanding examples are in short supply, those aspiring to greater heights in Christian life and service will find in the lives and work of these personalities fitting role models to emulate in their Christian pilgrimage." Unquote. Timothy Dudley Smith, biographer of Reverend John Stott, departed international evangelical Christian leader, would also say, and I'm quoting him, because I owe much to Christian biography in my own discipleship, and because my calling is to be a minister of the gospel, I cannot escape the hope that this book, that is John Stott's biography, may be of use within the purposes of God to inspire a reader here or there with a good example it portrays." Unquote. But beyond this intersection of purpose, however, Christian historians part ways with secular historians in their basic understanding of the moving force in historiography. They would consider history as, and I'm quoting one of them, the long unfolding of God's will, unquote. And consequently, again, I'm quoting, Christianity as a historical religion in the sense that its truth cannot be expressed except by reference to historical events, unquote. Following Jewish belief, they perceive an unmistakable pattern of God's intervention in history. The task of Christian historiography is thus, quoting, of discerning through historical events, God's plans for mankind, unquote. Taking scripture as a springboard then, one can identify God's saving acts in history and through it discern a plan which culminates in the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Scripture is thus a record of God's saving acts in history. In the German world, health is history, salvation history was used by Oscar Kuhlman to develop this position. In salvation history, God reveals himself in the events of history. This paper would follow the divine purpose agenda of Christian historians. But among others, the secular human reason approach has weaknesses which include expanding hope out of history. In a so-called scientific view of life, secularists see historical writing as, get the data, look at it carefully and responsibly, empirically and scientifically, as we would say, and I'm quoting someone, to see its structure and so to understand the principles of its sequences and changes, unquote. Humankind is thus at the mercy of the rational forces of time, a view which clearly cuts against the Christian position of the hand of a personal, loving, almighty, divine agent in the progress of history. Again, a purely so-called scientific view of history, that is being so-called objective, is illusory. It is not real. Humans have their affective sides. It is only when we consider this that we have a holistic history or people, I'm quoting, are frail creatures in the world of great spiritual forces and causes. Our loves and commitments become central to our knowing, unquote. Indeed, the illusory picture 
takes true humanity out of the picture. Hence the need for, I'm quoting, anecdotes, local gossip, profiles, and the unity that enrich and authenticate historical accounts, unquote. And for biography to bring out the real life or character of the person. It is true that brackets with the method of epoche, such as is employed in qualitative research as developed by phenomenologists, may be used as an attempt to address this. But how perfect can one be? This, however, does not mean that the need for objectivity in historiography is discarded. And Prof, Prof. Howell um, talked about this in the last session. Now, it may be sustained within the faith framework, but the Christian faith claims to stand for truth, just as objectivity also aims at searching for truth. In biographical writing especially, the author needs to be very much aware of this need as some form of attachment results in a biased picture. However, the truth remains that one cannot just supply information without making judgments. There needs to be measured assessment as well as the, and I'm quoting, the probing of psychological dispositions as an explanation why this happened and not that, unquote. In addition, the researcher needs to exercise critical judgment, separating facts from opinions, biases, and inconsistencies in the narratives of interviews. The background knowledge of the context social, economic, political, and so on, of the history, or in the case of biographies of the subject, will greatly help in this enterprise. Now, with the general background to the aspect of interpretation in hand, I will now proceed to see how these may be applied to the story of Samson Opong, aiding us to interpret the data we collected on him as a means to solving our research problem, the role of indigenous agents. Now, to enable us to understand the issues involved, we proceed to give a little glimpse into aspects of a Paul's life that relate to our objectives, aspects, um, and so on. And this we did through our research. And I'm presenting this for the sake of all of us who may not know too much about uh, the subject of our discussion. The prophet Samson Opong was born as Kwame Opong in about 1884 to non-Christian parents in a continuum in the Doma state, Bono region of Ghana. In his pre-Christian life, he acquired several traditional objects of power, suman, as the accounts would say, or or, well, um, fetishes in, in inverted commas, which were quite potent. So he made a name for his supernatural powers. Among the fetishes were those used for seduction of women, stealing of fowls, and ensuring good business in the market. Despite this, he was often considered a nuisance as he was known to cast spells on people which caused them bodily discomfort. Also, in narrating his story to Halliburton, Opon remembered himself as a gluten, humanizer, and drunkard. In the course of his life, he came under the influence of Christians and the gospel. One day, whilst working on a potion to kill someone supernaturally, he swooned and had a vision in which God reiterated an earlier call to ministry. This time he responded, bent his traditional paraphernalia when he recovered and started out as a prophet evangelist. Opposition from persons who disliked his rather plain talk ministry led him to seek the umbrella of the Methodist mission. 
The attachment gave him ecclesiastical authority to preach unhindered in several areas of modern day Ahafo, Bonu, Bonu East, and Ashanti regions. The results are well captured in the 1920 report of Reverend W.G. Waterworth, the minister in charge of the Methodist Ashanti mission at the time. And I'm quoting him. Not so long ago, Ashanti was full of closed lands at whose doors Christianity knocked in vain. But what a wonder it is today. Not only the closed doors flung wide open, but the people are aspiring after higher thoughts. And from all sides, appeals reach us for help. Send us a teacher and we'll become Christians. We rejoice in the great increase in numbers. We have in our midst an extraordinary evangelist, and the Spirit of God is working mightily, adding hundreds of souls daily to the flock of Jesus Christ. Some of these are heathen chiefs and fetish priests who publicly give up their idols and charms to be burned and embrace Christianity. The spiritual tune is also good. The work in the outstations is very encouraging. Almost all our chapels are crowded. More teachers and agents are badly needed for the increasing flock in the new places awaiting us. Large numbers of conversions were being made. The Methodist Chronicler Southern estimates that, and I'm quoting him, in less than two years, more than 10,000 Ashantis had been baptized and hundreds more were on the point of deciding for Christ on Now, How does one interpret the story of the prophet? Why so many conversions and that in such a short space of time, that's 1920 to 1928. Indeed, Ashanti was a closed door for Christianity as the religion appeared that of foreign and later enemy Europeans. Why should the ordinary Asante become a Christian? And how does all this help to answer the question of the role of indigenous lay agents in the ministry of the Methodist Church Ghana? The answer to the questions above may be arrived at only through engagement and reflection on the data collected through the fieldwork and readings. For a start, an outline of the story, in this case, the biography should be made, which I did. Then one can see one's way clearer for the interpretation exercise, using, of course, the Christian perspective of discerning the hand of God through the events of history and all of it to fulfill his purpose. In the case study at hand, one needs to point out that Christian missions from Europe started naturally in the coastal regions of Ghana from the late 15th century. Not too much fruit was born initially until from the 19th century, Basel and Wesleyan missionaries entered the scene. From the early decades of the 19th century, a gradual expansion of the Christian faith was achieved in the country, beginning from the coastal regions. Even though Asante was reached in the early decades of this expansion, the perception of the ordinary Asante was that Christianity was the religion of the whites. They had their own. So there was no need to convert. Later, Britain would go to war with Asante. And so Christianity changed status to the religion of the enemy nation. All this resulted in very low conversions among the Asante. But with the ministry of Prophet of Pong, the tale changed. Comparative figures can better tell the story. From a membership of 81 in 1901, the Ashanti mission of the Wesleyan Methodist Mission rose to 3,710 in 1910, and a cardinal increase of 4,480%. 4 
By 1920, the number had risen to 4,788 and adjusted the cardinal increase of only 26%. The initial large increase in membership to explain was largely the result of the annexation of Asante to the Gold Coast colony through war. The region thus opened to the influx of southerners mainly for trade and the administrative activities associated with this. Now, many of the newcomers were Christians, hence the large impact on church membership. After a while, the numbers had plateaued, resulting in the comparatively almost negligible increase in the second decade. The head of mission will lament, and I, and I quote him, Ashanti was full of close lands at whose doors Christianity knocked in vain. But between 1920 and 1928, however, when Samson Opong entered the field, the numbers shot up to 15,857, an increase of 11,069, or adjusted the cattle growth rate of 278%. At a southern, Chronicler of Methodist Ministry for the period would come and I'm quoting him again. In Opong, Ashanti saw one of the most remarkable movements in the history, not only of Gold Coast Methodism, but of the whole Christian church. In 1920, there appeared the man called of God to break the power of fetishism in Ashanti and change its history. The figures. 278% as against 26% eloquently tell the story that but for his ministry, no real breakthrough would have been made in Ashanti, and this not only for Methodism, but for other missions as well, as Opong worked as a man of God, even though under the Wesleyan Methodists, and that the Basel mission was also working in the area. Now, how does this relate to our research problem? Upon reflection, using also the insights provided by the wider reading in the context, one arrives at a solution. With a normal mode of training and ministry pattern using indigenous agency, Methodism was built to succeed to some extent, as was shown in some parts of the research. Perhaps among the coastal people who had been influenced by Western education, technology, and ways of life, good inroads could be made. Further inland, however, another type of ministry appeared to be needed. And it seems, and I'm preaching this from a Christian perspective, it seems that God in his wisdom raised something upon for that achievement. But raising this observation is the fact that only a few years earlier, another prophet, William Woody Harris, had similarly ministered powerfully in the western regions of Ghana with his charismatic style, which won even more people for the gospel. An estimate gives the overall number, including Cote d'Ivoire, as 200,000. The biography of Samson Opong showed that there was another kind of ministry which appeared to win certain classes of people which indigenous lay agents of the normal western type training were not reaching there appeared to exist indeed exceptions to the rule further down the history lane of ghana it would be seen that it was this as that type of ministry leading to the rise of the Pentecostal ministries that would win the day in Africa. So far, however, it appeared that the research problem had been solved, but with it came other questions that were related. Why had the Western type trained agents not been successful among those of the classes of people upon one? Reading wider in the Christian history of Africa showed that Opon and even Harris did not stand alone as indigenous charismatic prophets of God who ministered with large successes. 
and that around the same time, that is the early decades of the 20th century. Well-known examples of such persons would be Isaiah Shembi, who, who worked 1906 in South Africa, William Wade Harris, 1913 from Liberia, but ministering mainly in Côte d'Ivoire and the Gold Coast, Eric X. Braid, um, 1916, Nigeria, and, and, and Simon Kimbangu, 1921, in the Belgian Congo. There were several other dynamic lay indigenous men of God, and I should have added women of God, with an African orientation in ministry who would minister in a similar way. These men became the forerunners of the African independent churches. And later, with the rise of the Pentecharismatic ministries, it has become clear upon reflection that providentially, God was raising another kind of ministry pattern which was more indigenous and consequently spoke more fully to the primal worldview of the people. Indeed, this, I believe, was in the full plan of God for the Christian faith needed to be shown to be African also, and not just the revert side of the benefits of Western civilization as a modern missionary movement to Africa sometimes seemed to depict. The ministry of Samson Opong can thus be interpreted also in this wider light in the context of Africa. The conclusion. This paper set out to use a biographical method to answer a research question or to solve a problem. It has done so by using the story of the ministry of the prophet Samson Opong, whilst focusing on the historiographical, methodological aspects of sources and interpretation. Biographies may thus be used to explore research questions, but one must navigate the process with recourse to as primary a document as possible. We have shown that these could be written or oral, with a preference for written sources, since the accuracy of oral sources is problematic. Authenticity, secondary sources may only be resorted to if the quality of the work is not at stake. Indeed, acceptable scholarly work should always be done with primary sources. Secondary sources, however, are helpful in that they make the researcher aware of existing landmarks in the context and the story to be told. Again, some extremely helpful cross-referencing may be obtained through the initial work of a secondary source. In historiography, the issue of interpretation is key since it underlines the different approaches. This work is Christian, so it meant that we could only agree with our secular colleagues on the didactic rule of history. For the Christian, history was but an unfolding of the divine purpose. But in what way did it underline the story of Samson Opon? By researching into and constructing the biography of Opon, and through reflection on the wider readings available on the context, I was able to arrive at a considered view on an aspect of the role of indigenous lay agents in the growth of metallism and consequently of the Christian faith in Ghana. In relation to Opon, I understood that he was a special kind of lay agent who with an animated and indigenous worldview of religious response to the transcendent was able to more successfully win large numbers of indigents who could not be drawn to the faith with the more wasting moods at play in the initial efforts at evangelization. Researching and doing a biographical treatise on Prophet Samson Pong thus helped to solve an aspect of the research problem of the role of indigenous lay agents in the expansion of Methodism in Ghana. Che, I'm done. Yo, thank you so very much. You have done it methodically. We thank you so much. <laughs> You've been able to 
that within time. Uh, so we have some we've been able to spare some time. So we have additional uh, time to help us interact with our, our, our lecturer, our brother, and our dear friend. Walton, thank you so much for helping us to look into the life of Samson Opon. So the floor is open now. Question for clarification before we come to substantive questions on the issues presented. I would like particularly to encourage the students. Students, please take advantage of this uh, seminar and ask questions. Let's see you active, be very, very involved. So the floor is open for you to make your inputs. I'm not seeing any, if you are ready to ask a question or make a contribution, please do so. Okay. I think um, I saw Auntie Maureen's hand. Did I see it? Yes, you did. <laughs> and, then, and then Dr. Blasu. So Auntie Maureen, okay. then. Okay, you. thank you. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Uh, Sulisa. Thank you, Dr. Walton, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Getting to know um, about your research and also about the person you research. Um, some clarification. I noticed that the spelling of his name is O P O N. And then when you were talking about his parents, it's uh, O double P O N G. Is there a reason for that? Because I remember yesterday when uh, uh, Miss Koklulaye was presenting, there was this thing that came up about. A difference in the spelling of names in the in the descendants of uh, the deceased and in the funeral brochures so that's my first question uh with the spelling then the second one is towards the end you said the work is christian <laughs> i i don't understand that is it christian because you the researcher are christian or because uh, you were researching on a christian figure or there's a, a Christian process. Uh, if you could uh, just throw light on that, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I've gone back to uh, the script and trying to scroll through to find out um, the, the, the part um, that has the double P. Actually, um, Dr. Paul wasn't literate. He did not go to school. So it, it did not leave any documents. Um, the spelling of his name has been done in different ways by different writers. But I took um, my spelling from uh, the initial people who wrote on him. Um, so now I found the place. The prophet Samson was born as Kwame Opong. And this is, I guess, what was, was used by one of the initial writers. And thank you very much. I need to correct that. But all through, you realize that I was using O-P-O-N. Um, O-P-O-N is the one by the very initial writer who did work on him. So I've stuck to that one. Um, then with regards to um, that this work is Christian and all, it, it relates to interpretation. Um, I, I mentioned that um, secular historians have a way of interpreting history. Um, I, as a Christian, will interpret history as God moving through the events of time. And this, this is what I mean by this work is, is Christian. I try to be as objective as possible in the interpretation. I I I I I, I go in the direction that, that I have I've described. Okay, have I, thank have you. I helped? Uh, well, yeah. you mean your perspective is Christian because my perspective, uh, I, my I mean, perspective I is had, Christian. I heard that and I thought, oh, so <laughs> thank my you. My perspective, my perspective is Christian. Okay. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blasu. The methodology will be the same, but my perspective is Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tulisa. Thank you, uh, Dr. Walton. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm not pretty sure whether my uh, question is for clarification or a major one, but then I'm concerned about uh, what you said along the line uh, that um, some of the oral stories that you heard were too good to be true. And so yeah. you rejected them. So I was wondering, on what basis, how did you know they were too good to be true? Since if we I listened to Professor Bediako's presentation earlier, uh, we learned one should not have a preconceived mind already before going through this uh, research or analysis. Um, on what basis, what other information enable you to see embellishment in the stories that made them too good to be true and therefore rejected them? Skepticism. <laughs> ah, yes, I was skepticism. Skepticism. Um, um, actually, this, I did this quite some time back, so I've actually forgotten. But, but, um, um, you see, I was trying not to overstate my case. The gentleman worked with a lot of miracles. And um, so people, people knew him as a powerful man, supernaturally. And this, this, this particular story by this particular lady whom I interviewed appeared a little embellished. I'm sorry that I can't, I can't remember exactly now. But there, there were other stories. I'm sorry, this, this is a short paper, so it's, this is not all that uh, we may know about Okong, but he did, did a lot of miracles. I guess that's why he was influencing a lot of people with Christ. Um, um, those other miracles I, I documented. Um, so maybe the, 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 the word is skepticism. And most of the other ones, too, they were Corroborated by other people. This this one, I I I don't remember that any other person corroborated it. Even though it's possible that it may be a story that that will be going around. Um, so I I don't know whether whether I've been helpful. I I I didn't want to overstate. But the point is that he did a lot of miracles, and so. He was a man of God. Uh, people knew, knew him to be a man of God. But that, that particular story appeared a little em embellished. So I left it out. Thank you. Um, Dr. Walton, uh, yes, yes, he was non-literate and he, he was using the stone to read. Can you explain that? Uh, or is that one of the stories that we found too good to be true? <laughs> no, no. In fact, in my thesis, I, I did a whole <laughs> section on that. And yes, he, he according to him, he, he came across a stone whilst he had been initially in prison. You know? he, 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 he was not in, in the very good books of some of the traditional leaders, because initially he started branding some of the leaders as, as witches and stuff like that. So he was imprisoned and um, well, the, the leaders reported him and the civil authorities not wanting uh, the, um, the arrest and all that, uh, imprisoned him for a while. Um, and whilst in prison, according to him, he, he, he came across a stone. Um, in my research, I was, I was shown the stone. I even have a picture of it. And it, it, it is said that he would look at the stone and be able to read scripture. And so when he, he, he begins to preach, he looks at the stone and then the scripture text would come and, and he would call out the, the scripture text and then begin to preach with the, with, with this, with the scripture text. So he could read scripture from 
an ordinary stone. Have I? Yeah, answered? thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, may I come in, Dr. Sulisa, please? Dr. Sulisa is mute. Rabbi speaking, we can't get him. Oh, sorry. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Henry? Yeah, Henry, um, uh, th uh, thank Hansen, you. Hansen, if you raise your hand after this, then you can come. And then followed by Jeremiah. Yeah. Right. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sule, sir. Um, I, I, I want hey, to... No, you, you will come after Henry. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much, Dr. Sule, sir. And thank you, uh, Dr. Walton, for... The stimulating presentation. I, I'm trying to get my head still on the question of illiteracy. I'm trying to get my head around the uh, the response you've just given, and then I was also reflecting the other day, um, maybe on Monday or so. Somebody gave um, a devotional and mentioned that somebody was illiterate, and I was thinking. I think, but. In yours, you mentioned it, you, you said a little bit about uh, the person who's able to read from stone. And I'm thinking, the, what language was he reading? And in, and in that context, I'm asking uh, in, in, in academia or in the ACI, what would we consider as illiteracy? Is it when the person can't read English or can't read his own language? and can write his own language. I'm thinking of what we will, how we will define or look at illiteracy. Well, um, actually, whilst um, talking about Okong, I said he'd not been to school, so he could, he could not write his name in the usual way and we did not leave any documents. This was in response to Dr. Maureen's question. Um, with, with regards to the stone, he, he, he read the, 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 the scripture in tree. You look at the stone and then the read, read scripture in tree. Um, so, uh, being illiterate, well, it depends on your the, the perspective, and possibly Auntie Maureen can give us a better um, English definition of that. Um, um, so I, I I don't know whether I've I've I've, I've helped illiteracy. The, the traditional person is not necessarily illiterate, but if we, we we're talking about reading and writing. Yeah. Then possibly Opon was was illiterate. Well, well, well. Yeah, you <laughs> couldn't read. You couldn't read. You couldn't read material that had already been done by someone. The reading he did from, from the stone was su supernatural. That that's helpful. It's, it's a it's a, it's a yeah. it 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 raises the issue a little further for conversation. So uh, I'm glad you, you we touched on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think I would just want to say that uh, you could be referring to the, or turning to the chat box also, so there are certain things. Uh, Professor Lai says that literacy is the ability to read and write. And Auntie okay. Maureen said, Auntie Mary, help us out here. Auntie Mary. <laughs> <laughs> well. So perhaps we can also be told what is literacy in mother tongue. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. <laughs> okay, so if I think better comment, fine. Otherwise, Jeremiah, you have the floor now. Jeremiah. Yes, sir. Dr. Sule, sir, thank you, sir. I, I want to uh, appreciate Dr. Walton for very good uh, work done. I've um, learned a lot from what he has um, uh, rehearsed to us. Um, coming back to skepticism, uh, of course, while he was speaking, 
I, I know that I have a lot of um, similarities with a person that I'm working on, uh, James Suluma Deshonde, who also um, did a lot of uh, miracles in his um, uh, ministry. Uh, but when there was a cross um, uh, question that has to do with uh, uh, the reading from the stone, I begin to now uh, think again, because when he talked about two good to be true stories, um, reading on the stone, and then of course comparing it with uh, vivid um, uh, miracles of uh, hearing, uh, of um, insanity uh, being cleansed, uh, then I, I, I said, okay, uh, that could give me uh, a sense of uh, interpretation. So I was almost becoming uh, afraid on how to really go about doing some of the interpretations that has to do with the miracles that showing they performed. So, so, so that that is that was my concern. Uh, but when it was clarified by uh, the, the aspect of uh, reading from the stone, then I because uh, here in Nigeria also they've talked about Joseph Ayobabalala. Uh, a um, lot of stories of how he has gone to pray on the mountain and uh, his news have pierced the, the and he appeared to be telling us this is his knee this is this was where he was praying uh, this was where he stood for many hours and his knee pierced a stone so such kind of um, um, miraculous stories uh, for me also appear to be too good to be true and uh, of course I want to thank uh, Dr. Walton for, for clarify, clarifying that. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. So okay. the floor is open. Uh, I guess the word is skepticism. Yeah, OK. OK, Dr. Sulesa, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Walton for a splendid presentation. It was so concise and uh, very simple. To follow thank you very much sir and then i also noticed that um what prof adafani shared with us um the correlation between secular history and christian history he, he endeavored to bring it out clearly where they correlated and where they differed and i thank him also for that a lot of my questions have been um, answered the great white stone and all that but maybe I'll, the last one why they describe him as a great uh, fetish priest. I want to know why he put in there that they describe Sanson as a great fetish priest. Or nothing more than a great fetish priest. Well, wow. um, this, this is a perspective of the gentleman, Reverend, Reverend Schaefer, um, I guess it was unusual. It was not the, the, the same kind that people trained in the um, in the schools of the of the of the Western missionaries. And the Basel mission and and Wesleyan mission were training people in a particular way, and they were ministering in a particular way. Opons was different, and there were miracles, and and people were converting in large numbers. And somehow he, he seemed not to understand, so it, it didn't fit. It didn't fit the pattern, and and so his conclusion: this is um, fetishism. Yes, sir. Um, just yeah, a quick follow up. Yeah. So, with what Jeremiah said, uh, those of us who are working on Pentecostal phenomena, uh, we come across miracles in uh, deliverance and healing sessions. How do we put this in an academic setting so that it doesn't sound too good to be true? Uh, well, this, the discussion has, well, it did, it did start on Monday. And, okay. and the way that, that, that was uh, presented was skepticism. Can you make it corroborated among others? Um, I don't know whether others others want to want to comment, but.
but it's it's I I guess it's 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 a difficult area. But but among others, it should it should be collaborated, and um, possibly if there's a photograph, and I know photographs can be doctored, um, it should be so put that the 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 likelihood that it is being made up is reduced to the barest minimum. I, I, I don't know whether we've, we've helped. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, but, but I, possibly, this, 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 this is a general question. And, um, and yeah, and I think that there should be more contributions on, on this. Yeah. Okay. I, yes. Uh, I think maybe if I can respond a bit to Hansen, you know, it, it's, a, it's a matter of style and how you present what you have heard or seen. Um, in academic writing, obviously, you have your own opinions, subjective opinions, but you want to be objective as much as possible. So the language you choose, uh, if somebody says something and you agree with them, it's, there's a way you can put put it so that you don't fall, you don't become a victim of um, the language that your respond your respondents are giving you. You want to be objective. You want to present the facts as much as you can. And so, if there's a like, I think Professor Dufeni mentioned, um, you you have a fact of a myth. Um, that everybody can appreciate that this is what the people believe. But if you put it in the language such that in your commentary you come through as if you literally believe what is that, what is there, what has been projected, then that's where you have problems. But as as a, as as academic writer, you have the facts, it could be a myth, it could be a popular opinion, but how you present it will go a long way in, 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 in how you are assessed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too, um, Dr. Gezi. Um, the, the, challenge, the challenge here is um, something happens. It's not, it's not a myth. Contemporary issue, you know, a, a miracle. Someone is... Uh, goes through a deliverance session and is delivered of A, B, C, D, E. And then the, the, the researcher reports it. And quote, it appears, quote unquote, too good to be true. So how do you so put it that it does not appear too good to be true? And you say, Dr. Gezi, that the language you use Uh, yeah. Um. Um. Chair, Doctor um, Settles wants to wants to speak. Joshua, yes. Yeah, I I I was going to say in relation to Doctor Walton's uh, point and to that question, uh, there are facts and there are interpretations of facts. And uh, so we talk about a miracle or a deliverance session. You know, you are describing what takes place and you are presenting people's interpretation of what takes place. In most cases, you are only reproducing what they, the, they themselves are seeing or their interpretation of what took place, which is different from what your own uh, assumptions or interpretations may or may not be. So in the case that Dr. Walton mentioned, someone goes for a deliverance sessions and they say that uh, they were delivered of a demon. Certainly you can report that in your thesis. The person said they were delivered of a, de a demon. That is a factual statement. It is a fact that the person said they were delivered of a demon. It is a fact that they went to a deliverance session, you know, uh, but in terms of, can you verify in some empirical way that a demon left the person's body? 
Well, that becomes a matter of faith in any case. But the fact is, within the context of the deliverance session, the person went for prayers and they were delivered of a demon. And they said that that is what took place. You can say that and nobody will take you on. Because what you are then reporting is a fact. The fact of, of their own testimony of what happened to them. And I think this is important that uh, part of our task is allowing people's own voices and interpretations of their experience to speak without imposing assumptions or judgments about uh, the empirical ver verifiability of those, those facts. Because when you are dealing with in the realms of faith or even the primal or Christianity generally, we are ultimately we are dealing with ultimate concerns that are a matter of, of interpretation and not necessarily of scientific verifiability. So if, if I say that I was delivered of a demon, who are you to dispute me? You can't say that I was not. And that would obtain whether you are a secular academic yeah. or a Christian academic. You have to report what the person says and what they believe takes place within them regardless of your own particular views of, you know, whether it is too good to be true or not. Now, certainly you can say it appeared that what they are saying seem, may seem to be too good to be true. However, they believe thus, 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 thus. You can certainly say that to, to show your own indication of your views about the issue. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Auntie Koklu, then Auntie Maureen, and then Germain. Time is. <clears throat> okay, okay, thank you. All uh, right. My, mine is a question. Thank you, Dr. Walton. Thank you, Dr. Sulisa, for the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> Dr. <coughs> Sorry. Dr. Walton, you yes. made mention of Bono and Bono State, and I am all lost. Where is it on the map? <laughs> okay, Did you former, former, former can, I, can, I, can I please finish? Can I please finish? Former, um, bro sorry, go on. Um, did you use a map of that time, or you are using a contemporary map of Ghana at this time? I have no clue where Bono is. I am lost. If there is a map, please show us. Thank you. Uh, uh, so well, well I, I, I think okay, there's there's no map right right now. But th that that's a former Bronghaf region, which it has been sub subdivided now. Um, are you okay? So it's a former Br Bronghaf region. Um, yes, maybe just in case you will want to um, republish, it will help to give us that geographical location, an idea. Otherwise, I, I'm, I'm lost. Okay, thank you. For a Ghanaian, I am very lost. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you, Auntie Koklu. Yes, um, yes think so next, I think. Yes, yes. And then, yeah, I will be the last. Oh. Um, Dr. Walton, yes, I want yes. to come back to um, the testimony you excluded. Obviously, you see it's raising quite uh, uh, some uh, <laughs> heat for you. Yeah. Um, I, I've asked a question. Did you exclude it because it was told by a woman, the, this uh, story that is too good to be true? Because if that is so, then it shows your own coloration that it had to be, you know, a fantastic story because told by a woman. And as Dr. Settles has uh, said, it, it, would be, it would have been good, uh, I mean, it is helpful if you just stated or narrated that story and leave it to the reader to judge and maybe conclude by saying you didn't find any material to corroborate it. But it was something you got from the field and there was something about it that made you take the decision not to include it. So I think there's uh, uh, there's credit in just letting people speak for themselves, as uh, Doctor Settles has so rightly said. That's what I would I would add. 
Well, thank you, Auntie Maureen. Uh, it was not because it was from a woman. <laughs> there were a lot of other, lot of other stories from women. Which were, but you see, the thing is, I, I had lots of other stories, miracles which, which the gentleman uh, performed, which, which I included. But I felt, I didn't want to, as I said, overstate my case. And I wanted to avoid hagiography. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, to, to leave it out. Now, it was not a necessary piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. So I just decided it was it's going to cause more problems. So let me just leave it out. Yeah, it's still causing problems, even though you left it out. Anyway, oh, no, my because, sister, because, be, because, see, be, 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 because I wanted to explain, because yeah. I wanted to explain uh, yeah. to the people after us that in the process of, of researching, if you become across those, and so you have, you have to take a decision. I took the decision to go the way I've gone, but they may, and we've, we've kind of elaborated on it, we've explained, you may decide to, 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 to do it the way the Dr. Sessettles has said. And possibly you may, you may do that because it contributes to the, the conclusions and so on. But I, mine didn't really add, add or subtract. Yeah. All right. Then a second question I had, if I may ask it, uh, Dr. Sulisa, yeah. is, you know, you said uh, he read he read the stone and he got uh, scriptures that he used to preach. Yes. So I'm asking, so were there, um, were these biblical passages, was, was there correspondence or corroboration, as you would say, of those uh, passages with, you know, of what he, he was preaching? Exactly. In other words, uh-huh. So they could exactly. be found in the Bible, in the language? Exactly. They could be found in the Bible. He was reading scripture, actually. Oh, wow. Wow. So it, 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 it was miraculous. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Jeremiah, for the last. Jeremiah, for the last. Yeah. Th thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Solomon. Sol 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 uh, actually, we, we have uh, examples of a uh, uh, example of a battery who was uh, uh, totally blind and uh, uh, in the CAC that could uh, quote a scripture, ask people to read and where they are reading. If, if they miss, uh, read, uh, misquote, it will, it will tell them, no, you have, you have not read the correct uh, uh, passage. And of course, uh, when you check it, you know that he is correct. Yeah, and definitely is blind. Where is totally blind, and his ministry was spectacular in the Christ Apostolic Church, Nigeria. I, wa I want to thank um, Dr. Setu for uh, helping, helping us to actually uh, state how it should be done, uh, actually presenting it as it is, and then, of course, offering uh, to uh, corroborate it with uh, um, our own um, interpretative uh, um, uh, format based on um, the, the uh, interpretative uh, um, concerns that we are coming up with. And I think that is helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think our time is up and we want to say a big, big thank you to our dear friend, James Walton, Reverend Dr. James Walton. You have, you have done justice to the topic. God bless you. We'll now Thank take, you very much. It's a pleasure. We we'll now take the last one, and that one, uh, that's the final lecture. That's lecture seven, researching biographies and African Pentecostal contribution by Eric Asare. Eric, you have the floor. Is Eric there? Eric. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we have the floor now. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm presenting from ACI, researching biographies, a Pentecostal contribution.
Yes, right. you can. Introduction. Yes, can you hear me? Can I hear you now? Yes, thank you. Introduction. Importance of biography. Robert Lyadin with the life stories of the many great men and women of God in series of publications, God's General, pointing out how some succeeded and others failed. Even though Lyadin's approach is commendable and worth emulating, I have issues with how he selected Christian leaders for his reflections, in which he almost neglected African and Asian leaders and reformers. With this neglect, Leiden seems to be telling African Christian. By this neglect, Leiden seems to be telling African Christian, sorry, I had an issue here, to tell stories about their great Christian men and women. Have African Christians succeeded in this biographical task? In search for an answer to this question, I found out that the careers of William Wadi Harris, John Swatson, Samson Opon, Joseph Babalola, Garrett Braid, Simon Kimbungu, Isaiah Sham, and several other dynamic African of the continent, a good number of them being women, have already caught the attention of scholars. None of the prophetic figures, according to Kwame Bediakun, was considered by a missionary society. Yet, their ministries contributed significantly to the growth of mission churches. My search also took me to the website of the Dictionary of African Christian Biography, from which I read the following mission statement. The project, the mission of the ACB is to collect integral to the scholarly understanding of African Christianity. Two other things are the reason African Christian biography, a cluster publications for the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the ACB, and the fact that the dictionary accepts entries that are written in English, French. Portuguese and Kiswahili languages. I read many stories, including Andrew Wall's entry on Kwame Bidiabu. From the example cited so far, it is clear that many African and North American scholars have politically written and reflected on the contributions of some notable African to the development of African and world Christianity. Despite those contributions, there are still many African Christians whose lives, ministries remain unsung and unknown to the wider Christian world. One area where biographica, one area where biographies have not received much attention, as we have discussed in earlier presentations, is Pentecostalism as a contribution to this ongoing Christian biographical research projects. I studied the prophetic ministry of Peter Bafo Apiedu. Specifically, I examined Apiedu sermons and prophetic songs as a contribution to African spirituality and theology. I want us to look uh, at uh, Hello, uh, hello uh, Eric, could you make your yes. slides move? They are not moving. I don't see it moving. Unless I'm the, the only slide. person, it's only it's only the first slide that you have there. Uh, they've not been moving. They're not been moving. Uh, you are not using your slides, uh, so oh, it's a bit you, distracting because it's still yeah. focused on the first slide. If you can even present, uh, project the slide. Is it, it, it okay? Yes. Are they moving? Okay. Yeah, but you you need to use the presentation. The, the slide go go. You need to go to. Dr. Watts, eh, sorry, Dr. Gazi will help you. Oh, yes, uh, just to present this, the slide uh, in a presentation mode. That's good. If, yes. if you go to slideshow. Okay. And then start some. 
for the menu item, you should see slideshow on top. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then begin, yeah. So or from slideshow. where you are. Yes. Is uh, it showing now? Yeah. No, you've not clicked on the. So, so, so from current slide. Yes. Click on yes. present from current slide. Is it showing? I'm moving here. We are not seeing it. Have you clicked on? Um, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I think there's a bit of a delay. Yes. The IT team are here to help me. Okay. That's fine. Uh, Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Okay, so Eric, you can continue. Yes. Um, can you see the movement now? Hello? Please, you move on. You go on. You go on. Yeah, unfortunately, no, but I'll, I'll, you go on as the moderator is saying. Okay. Okay, so I'm watching it. Right. So we look at the life, works, and prophetic ministry of Peter Bafo Apiadu. Peter Bafo Apiadu is a retired minister of the Church of Pentecost, who is noted for his deep Pentecostal spirituality and sacred songs. Apiadu was born in 15th April 1946 in Cape Coast and was raised by his deceased parents at Ayure a small town in Ashanti region. Apiadu's parents, Openi Daniel Kofi Juma, father and deceased Dickness Mary, also known as Aban, both were from the royal class of their respective hometowns. At the time of political reforms and pre-independent struggles, Apiadu endured harsh economic hardships throughout his childhood. Many of the challenges, including the demise of his father, that brought untold hardship on his mother and siblings. Joblessness, poverty, hunger, scarcity, and a space of political ideologies of Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, compelled him to pursue God. Later in his pastoral and prophetic ministry in the Church of Pentecost, Apiadu faced other challenges, including the death of his two children, intimidation from superiors, and many other personal challenges. Those things helped him develop a strong faith in God. His pursuit of God, he further developed a responsibility of his prophetic ministry. For that, he received of his prophetic songs and messages. In all, Apiadu has over 400 to his credit, to which 30 were studied. These songs were received by divine inspiration through dreams, Bible reading, preaching, worship, and personal meditation. Some of the songs are sung in churches and homes across Ghana and beyond. And for the sake of this presentation, I would like to walk us through some of the songs, at least about 10 of them, so you appreciate his contribution. The first song that Piedu received is Mom Maso, and I'll sing it. If you have the tune, you can hum with me. Mom Maso, Mom Maso, Mom Maso, Mom Maso, Mom Maso, Mom Maso, Mom Mani Din So, Amen Yina Beunse, Yesu Dina Ya Maso. And there were songs like these. He says, Oh, Jesus, we had songs like Yehovah, me potent, my bank is in the midst of 
mi che mi gwan ko bia mi wura mi da wa si da orinya mi da orinya mi da that's another song then we have yesu mo ni awaye do sun yesu mo ni awaye do sun titin tridi nya me ni wo ni awaye do sun then we have songs like and so no yes obey and so no yes obey bibi ara ni wa nya me to me ye and so no yes obey ye da wasia e fata ye yi wa ya e fata we yi e fi owum wa ma yen kwan ni awi enti ye da wasia e fata then we have songs like minim ni din o ni jesus o ya hini mu hini o ye re mu ewra minim ni din o ni jesus then we have mami nye senia titi funu ye mami nina senia ujina jesus misra u mira misra u de nina ma pentiko sujano mra mi mu then we have midofu kesie mi mawamu Finally, the song for this presentation is Okamafu, Okamafu Nyame, Odimafu, Odimafu Nyame, Rabedima Semina Mame, Mame Ni Yiji. Literally speaking, Momasu simply means lift it up, lift it up, lift high the name of Jesus for all nations to see that the name of Jesus is exalted. Then we have jesus you can near essence jesus is a light that shines he will shine brightly in your darkness that you do not miss your way then you know you're free will come and praise him from the depth of your heart yes jesus is my bedrock my solid rock my bank my, my my fortress then we have songs like orinya midda jesus will never leave me when I walk through the valleys, when I walk through the waters, when I walk through the fire, he will never leave me. Yesu mo nyawaya dosu. Thank you, Jesus, for the many wondrous things you do. And sonny ye so beye simply means that God, nothing is impossible to our God, and God is able to do everything. If we thank you, it is worth it. Miniti only Jesus. I know his name, he is Jesus. Hawkins is the Lord of Lords. I know his name, he is Jesus. Then the other songs, Let me be like my forebears. Let me stand as they did. And it's a plea, it's a song of plea to God. And it's a plea, it's a song of plea to God. Medofo Kesemi Mawamo is a song appealing to his great lover, Jesus, thanking him for not letting him die and giving him life. Then the Okamafo, Okamafo Nyame, the spokesperson appeared to saw Jesus as a spokesperson who stands in for him. The lyrics of these prophetic songs were received with specific tunes and recorded in key. Sorry. okay now right thank you the lyrics of these prophetic songs were received with specific tunes and recorded in key it was based on the discussions of these songs napiedus addresses and sermons and prophetic messages that are assess his contribution to african christian spirituality and theology appear spirituality Peter White defines spirituality as the core of the Christian experience and encounter with God in real life and action. This ex implies that spirituality is at the center of Christian faith and it relates to an experience of God in human life. Spirituality is therefore experiential in nature, experiencing God in real life situations. Such experience of spirituality is deeply personal and vastly tradition influenced. And they differ among Christians of different times, faith, 
traditions, and cultural settings. It is against this backdrop of differences in the experience of spirituality that this subsession examines the uniqueness of Apiedu's spirituality. A connection between God, human life, and spirituality is instructive. As we noted above, Apiedu's life was punctuated with many challenges, including the demise of his father during his childhood, the harsh treatment he and his siblings received from the extended royal family members, the struggles and the termination of his appointment as a pupil teacher, the death of his two promising children, including his son, who was then the only graduate in the family. The other harrowing experiences he went through during his prophetic ministry in the Church of Pentecost. These experiences in Apiadu's life contributed to his spirituality. In the midst of the many challenges, Apiadu pursued God through faith in Jesus Christ. In Apiadu's view, God is not an abstract idea or a figment of human imagination. God is a living reality, a force, and a personality that intervenes in real life situations to liberate his people during crisis. One can therefore argue that Apiadu's life experiences and his faith in God mark the foundation of his spirituality. This confirms the earlier observation of spirituality as encountering God in the midst of human life. And there were certain characteristics that shaped Apiadu's spirituality or contributed to his spirituality. And these were intensive prayer, fasting, and worship life, the centrality of the Bible, strong faith in God, and prophecy. Theology as an academic discipline has been approached from very critical perspectives through time and space. However, Martina Rossi, Kenneth Archer, and other scholars have called for the revision of traditional way of doing theology, which is deemed too intellectual. Prosin has called for a new way of theologizing in which the lived Pentecostal Christianity, particularly its praise and worship, is considered as a mode of theology. African spirituality remains one of the major agendas in African theology. Most of the African theologians who operate in the field of African spirituality are particularly interested in exploring the nexus between spirituality and theology. John Mbiti, one of the pioneer African theologians, has observed that spirituality belongs to people's identity as individuals and as communities. And whether people recognize it or not, all areas of people's lives seem to have a dimension of spirituality. In view of the importance of the African spirituality, African theologians cannot ignore the rich mind of African spirituality in their craft of authentic theology. The fact that Apiadu's theology emanated from his spirituality, which was marked by a life of prayer and worship, strong faith in God, prophecy, and others, implies that spirituality and theology should go hand in hand. Such a marriage will be in the service of church and state. Piedu's major contribution to African spirituality and theology is in the area of Christology. Piedu's spirituality has taught us that Christ is superior and he wields control over all forces, including ancestral courts, witches, and other spiritual forces. This is why Christ is the central focus of Pentecostal spirituality, not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it is in Christ that one can entrust his or her future life in its entirety. Christological titles. Theologically, Apiedu's Christological contribution adds up to the African theological scholarship, particularly on the Christological titles which have engaged the attention of African theologians in their quest for an authentic Christology in Africa. Such an authentic Christology should come from people's experiences of Christ in their everyday life. One way in which we can appreciate people's experience with Christ is by examining how they use titles for Christ. Titles in African worldview. 
Emmanuel O. Nwaru has pointed out that this is one of the oldest approaches to Christology in the New Testament. Generally, the African primal worldview encourages the use of titles in not only addressing persons of rank and honor in society, but also in evoking the deity. These titles, according to Nwaru, afford us to say what needs to be known of and about Jesus Christ in relation to his character, mission, and office in the African context. We have Christological titles in the Aladura Church, where Deji um, pointed out names like Olu Wasandi, uh, Olu Dande, and the others. These are Christological titles that are reflected in Aladura songs and prayers. Now we are looking at Abiyadu's Christological titles from his prophetic songs. In the same vein, the study of the prophetic songs of Abiyadu also reveals Christ as light. And of course, we saw from some of most of his songs, Jesus, Yekania, Esre, and the others. Spokesman of Kamafo, protector, and then provider. He also presents the deity of Christ and his transcendent nature. With this, Abiyadu is emphasizing the dual significance of Christ to the African Christian. Christ as our Lord can help us meet our existential, physical, and spiritual needs. Expressed differently, Christ has the power to deal with our struggles in life and our fears of evil spirits and other external hostile agencies more powerful than man. This assessment of Apiadus Christology is in line with Kinsley Labi's view that Pentecostal spirituality appeals to the African primal worldview and aspirations, which includes man's quest for salvation from supernatural sources to live life meaningfully. The centrality of the Bible in Apiadus ministry the first tenet of the Church of Pentecost reads, in part, we believe in the divine inspiration and authority of the Bible, that the Bible is infallible in its declaration, final in its authority, all sufficient in its provision and comprehensive in its efficiency. This implies that in the COP context, the Bible is not a mere textbook. It is seen as a sacred, authoritative, and instructive. Apiadu subscribes to this tenet, the Bible is central to his spirituality. In a citation presented to him in the Gosu area on the occasion of his retirement from active ministry of the Church of Pentecost, Apiadu is a student of the Bible like Ezra. This is true because I have personally seen Apiadu spending several hours meditating on scriptures almost every day and particularly during moments of prayer and fasting. Apiadu finds the Bible as an important source of Christological reflections. He agrees with Emmanuel Marte's suggestion that African Christology should be expressed in African idiom and in continuity with the Christology that has been expressed by the New Testament writers. To this end, Abiyadu has come out with some Christological titles in his reflection on pages in the Bible, particularly the New Testament. Some of the Christological titles in this category include Christ as a brother, Christ as head of principalities, and Christ as all-inclusive gift. Like the Christological titles in his songs, these titles also point us to the relevance of Christ to man's existential, physical, and spiritual needs. In Christ, man is fully secured. With this contribution, Apiadu adds to the already African Christological titles such as healer, brother, chief of all his, and more importantly, ancestor of which Kwame Bediakum is a great contributor. Through Apiadu's meditation and literal study of the Bible, 
he is able to deepen his spirituality and receive spiritual songs and inspired messages out of which he theologizes and expresses the mind of God on issues affecting himself and the people he ministered to. Abiyadus experience challenges African theological scholars to be critical of the rationalistic Western approach to the Bible, which was influenced by the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, according to Andrew Walls, helped bracket out sections of the Bible that now appear to belong to an earlier age of God's dealings with humanity. This Enlightenment influenced pursuit of Christian theology is partly responsible for the recession of Christian presence in the modern West. Therefore, to be relevant to Christianity in Africa, African theologians should also consider the Bible as an important source in the expression of theology. The African theologians should also be interested in how Christians read and understand the Bible and how the understanding of the Bible inform their spirituality and theology. Finally, Apiadu's prophetic ministry reminds us that the traditional academic way of doing theology urgently needs revision. His life and ministry further affirms the search for creative ways of theologizing in the global south where Christianity is growing in unprecedented pace. Apart from the critical and the scientific way of doing theology, Apiadu is informing us to be equally mindful of lived experiences of the corporate church and the individual Christians as important ingredients in constructing authentic theology in Africa. In other words, theology should emanate from Christian practices, practices and activities. An examination of Apiadu's prophetic ministry, particularly his prophetic songs and messages, has underscored the importance of Pentecostal spirituality to the craft of African theology. Pentecostal theologian Frank Micaiah agrees Pentecostals have always favored testimonies, choruses, and prayers over intellectual or critical reflection as the means by which to interpret the gospel. Hello, Eric. Hello, Eric. Hello, Hello, I can hear you. Yes. Yes, we are not hearing you. Wow. C can you hear me, sir? I can hear you now. Yes, I'm, I can hear you now. I think network challenges here, but I'll take that again. Pentecostal theologian Frank Micaiah agrees Pentecostals have always favored testimonies, choruses, and prayers over intellectual or critical reflections as the means by which to interpret the gospel. If this is the case, then we should do African Pentecostal theology by taking Pentecostal songs, sermons, testimonies, and other practices seriously. We should also bear in mind that worship is a very important source of theology. Apiadu's contribution suggests to the African theologian that there are so many resources from Pentecostal grassroots as spirituality that can be used for constructing authentic African theology that has the potential of enriching and reviving world Christianity. Conclusion. Apiadu's prophetic ministry is characterized by a rich spirituality and theology that challenges African theological scholars to rethink the way they do theology. A theology that takes seriously the experiences of the African Christians. A theological reflection on the individual experiences of the Christian faith in Africa is crucially needed in our time for it is one of the ways in which we can make an authentic contribution to African Christian spirituality and theology. I therefore submit that the religious experiences of the individual Christian is essential in our quest for an authentic African theology in the 21st century. 
The African theologian should critically examine the spirituality of the grassroots Christians as well as the lived corporate experiences of the various churches. This is particularly important because the individual spirituality is informed by the corporate spirituality and vice versa. And it is in the examination of these religious experiences, including the songs, sermons, testimonies, prayers, that we can discern their theology as it happened in the case of Apiedu. What this means is that the African theological scholar should always work in partnership with his or her non-academic counterparts at the grassroots level and also among the pastor theologians who theologize every day through the pulpit ministry of the church. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you very, very much for some such, uh, Very brilliant. sorry for the interruptions. Yes. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. That has been so enriching. Unfortunately, you do have questions to answer. <laughs> Uh, according to, the, according to uh, our program. So I just want to say thank you. I don't know whether it was intentional or you just want to end it at this point. Um, but it's now time for me to make my closing remarks. And I just want to say that um, we've had some, some challenges. From the beginning, I was uh, not connected, so I couldn't hear from the beginning, the, uh, the devotion. But I want to say thank you as I heard the tail end of what uh, Dr. Gezi was able to present. Thank you for uh, the devotion. You began the day and it was so good with uh, an inspiring uh, devotion, especially focusing on um, um, Nicodemus and um, at least we can learn from Nicodemus that he was humble, very courageous, and, and he was willing to go down and to learn. And I think when we want to do our biographies, we should have that humility and going down to, to get the stories and to see the hand of God working. Uh, so in our bibliographical studies, uh, in our biological, um, bibliogra uh, sorry, biographical studies, sorry, in our biographical studies, we need to recognize that the Lord Jesus, the factor of Jesus being central and also what he's doing uh, so that in our biographies, we are able to bring out this, that God is at work with individuals and to see uh, what God is doing, accompanying those people and not to just see uh, their lives are just stories, ordinary stories, but God at work with, with them and some of the lessons that we can learn. So thank you, Dr. Gezi, for helping us. And then we took the fifth lecture that was delivered by Auntie Mary. And she looked at biography as an approach for exploring a key research question. And she shared her experience that when she uh, wanted to do her studies, she, it came to a point where she wanted a breakthrough and not knowing the way to go. Her supervisor, uh, Professor Walls, was able to guide her to come to study an individual, a person who really helped her to be able to get all that she wanted. That's uh, Robert Smith. And, and some of the useful lessons, how we need to persevere, some of the rationale that we need to have when we are going to do bi biographical studies, and the need to persevere, making sure that we do not allow uh, a lot of things to make us deviate from uh, the resources or the information that we need because we come to so much information but we need to be able to make that uh, to be able to decipher to know what material we want to use and so on and the biographical studies can help us to be able to do that then we also came to uh, Dr. James Walton, who was able to share in a very systematic way how he went about his study of um, individuals or African contribution 
to the growth of the church and looking at especially the lay persons and focus was on uh, Samson Opon, whom God used in a very dramatic way to lead to uh, the expansion of the Methodist Church and Christianity in general in Asante and then the Brown Alpha regions. So um, he shared some things, very, very rich experiences, and how we need to be able to uh, look at our biographical studies, knowing that we are doing this from Christian perspective, being very uh, objective, and looking at facts by interpreting and not forgetting this important truth that in Christian history, uh, we want to see the unfolding of God's will, God's working in, in, with individuals, and how God, um, God leads people and, and then the, God, the grace of God at work in the end. Uh, unlike a secular um, you know, history that is more focused on just using rational reasoning to come to conclusion. In Christian history, we cannot forget the God factor and some of the moral lessons that these studies are supposed to help us to do. And Eric has helped us to see that uh, when most of the time we, most scholars, Western scholars tend to forget about the indigenous agency, that's the contribution of African indigenous persons. But uh, he has made us to see that if you want to really have authentic African theolo theology, African theologians cannot forget those are the grassroots. And, uh, and he used the person of Eric, uh, sorry, uh, Apia Drew, Reverend Apia Drew story to illustrate how his theology is enriching and some of the rich songs. This man has had a great impact, not only in the Church of Pentecost, but all over uh, the church in, in Ghana and beyond. His songs, his ministration, and all these things, his experiences. So we need to ask him, uh, I like the way he expressed it. He said, uh, academic theology must go hand in hand with um, what is happening in the, the grassroots spirituality, uh, the grassroots spirituality. So uh, we should not do this touch theologizing, but we should take seriously the African indigenous spirituality into consideration in our theologizing. So I want to say a very big thank you to our presenters, Dr. Rudolf Gezi, Professor Gillian Mary Bediako Auntie Mary, Dr. Reverend Dr. James Walton, and then Reverend Eric Asari. Thank you for your excellent presentations. And I think we can all say with Peter, it is good that we are here. We wish that we could build uh, uh, three booths so that you people can be there and we will be there to continue to listen to you. So thank you so much also uh, for all of you being so patient. Though there were some few challenges, we want to say a big thank you to the ICT team for helping us in our time of challenges. And for all of you, for your patience, your contributions, and, and, and making the whole uh, program today to be a great success. Thank you for the past three days. I think we have had a very rich uh, feast of uh, knowledge, uh, sharing a lot of information. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So, Rector, Dean, thank you for giving me the opportunity to chair today's function. And with this, I will now want to invite uh, the, the Dean, if he has some information, after which it will hand over to Rector to uh, conclude for his concluding remarks, and we end the, our seminars. Thank you for your attention. Is that in there? First slide. First slide. First slide. Well, 
if it's not available, then we, we, we may as well proceed. Yeah. And, and bring uh, this year's seminar to a close. Um, I think we'll all agree, you know, participants from all over the world, from sister institutions and so on, we all agree that uh, these three days have been very rich. Rich in terms of devotions, presentations, and discussions. And it is therefore in order, following from what Dr. Sulisa has just said, to say thank you very much to all our resource persons, those who led the devotions, those who made the presentations, those who chaired the sessions, but also participants who have been very active in raising issues and contributing to discussions. On this note, it's important to take cognizance of the fact that I would have wished that our students would have been more involved in the discussions than, than they were. So we look forward to greater student involvement, contributions and questions uh, in subsequent uh, seminars. We have heard in these three days about the fundamentals we need to be able to research when it comes to biographies. The basics in regard to history biography and the whole area of historiography and beyond the basics we have through the presentations come to appreciate how to identify topics that may be of interest to us that would want to research into through to the resources that may be available to us the carrying out of the research itself, bringing our research to a good conclusion, all the presentations in one way or the other have been offering us guidance on aspects of this journey. But beyond that, we're privileged also to hear from Angus and Kayama about what we do with our research output when it comes to publication, how to transform our thesis or dissertation, as the case may be, into material that can be published with specific targets in view. And we are thankful for that. And I'm sure knowledge from their sharing would inform how we proceed beyond our theses and dissertations. It is striking that a lot of the research that has gone on and is ongoing at ACI would appear to focus on various personalities. I found that very interesting. And in this, seminar, this year's doctoral seminar, many personalities have been introduced to us and we have been reminded of others as well. Some of them from long ago and others from more recent times. And at least in this last presentation from somebody who is still active. So in these presentations, we have encountered lay people, evangelists, prophets, ministers of the gospel, people who may describe as linguists, certainly theologians, and of course, uh, composers. And we are grateful to God for all of these different kinds of personalities that we have encountered in this year's seminar. All of them, in one way or the other, remind us of our own lives and how we lead these lives in terms of 
what we may capture as our own life stories or what others may want to delve into with regard to the lives we lead at this time. Telling our own stories or having others tell the stories of our lives. But in these sessions, we have encountered a situation where we have had testimonies in the sense that in telling about others, some of our presenters have told their own stories, how they carry out their research work that they have shared with us. And for that, we are grateful to God. And I hope we would each be inspired by the stories we have heard. The need for us to persevere and not give up, to be detectives, people looking out for evidence and being in a position to weigh the evidence and place the right kind of weight on each piece of evidence. In all of these, I think one feature that has also become very clear is that God as the God of the past, the present, and the future is also the source of all knowledge, is the truth. And that none of us can pursue knowledge or the search for truth without God. Whether it's in terms of looking for a topic to work on, that may come to us through prayer or even dreams, or that moment of discovery that can be attributed only to God. Therefore, whatever research we pursue, from these three days, I think we've been reminded of the fact that we must take account, account of God's rule in our search for knowledge and truth, and that we should proceed under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So then, the lives we lead now, the lives that we may write about or others may write about because they see fit to do so, should be lives that can inspire others. And we can so inspire others only if we live consistently and constantly in the presence of God and under the guidance and enablement of his Holy Spirit. I hope that we have all been blessed in these three days. Yes, we should have dealt with these matters a year ago, but God in his wisdom brought us to this point and the blessings we have derived from our time together should lead us into saying thank you to God for his mercies. I wish you all the best and God willing we'll be able to meet again in a year's time for another doctoral seminar. Thank you and God bless you. Now we'll have to take the closing prayer. I don't know whether the dean is now available. Uh, yes, uh, Rector. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, I had to uh, step out uh, to deal with something. Yeah, just the announcement that I gave during the uh, break uh, that the uh, uh, topic presentation uh, seminar has been postponed to the 31st of March, next week, Wednesday. So a new invitation link will be sent to both students and faculty. So you look out for that and also the time. Uh, the time uh, uh, will be stated on it. So please bear this in mind. Thank you very much. Well, thank you also, Dean. Uh, may I throw open the invitation? A voice that we haven't heard to say a closing prayer for us.
anybody who we haven't heard from ready to say the closing prayer for us? Please, shall we? Yes, Rachel. A little problem with the. I'm not what I'm muted or. Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry. You, you are now muted again. Hello? Well, Rachel, Hello. you are on YouTube now. So you okay. can. Father, we thank you so much for. Thank you for the opportunity to hear the voices of these wonderful and excellent uh, presenters. From Monday, those who presented, we are grateful to you so much for their lives. We thank you for the faculty. We thank you for students alike and everyone that participated. We are grateful for the grace and strength you've given us to learn new things regarding our work. We pray that all those who presented, all the energy that are gone out of them, you replenish and you give them new ideas again. So when we meet again next year, by your grace and mercies, will be blessed by them again and all those who will be presenting next year, God willing. We pray that, Lord, the rest of the days ahead of us will be very grateful and then will be will go well with us. Those of us who are also preparing for our work, still researching those on the field and those who are yet to, we ask for grace, we ask for insight and illumination to be able to investigate rightly and come out to the right uh, research questions and ideas that will be a blessing to other people as well. We thank you for hearing us and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. And God bless you all. God bless you too. Rector. Hey, Marie. Bye bye. Professor <laughs> Kashi. <laughs> Thank you all. Grateful. Thank you for your concluding remarks. That was one lecture on its own. <laughs> hey, Marie. <laughs> I, I, I thought so. I thought so. I thought so. Mm. It's an article. I think it should hey. be published. Thank you, our <laughs> professor, our rector. God bless you, Papa. <laughs> I, I am I'm living here in peace before Maureen continues. <laughs> it was nice to hear you, though. <laughs> Blessings on you. <laughs> I thought I was the only one who knew that I was the whole lecture I had written long ago before today. Very much so. Oh, we are there. Oh, so, so. Uh, Sergeant Cameroon still in trouble. Thank you, Marie. I hope you are fine. <laughs> Thank you. Please uh, greet, greet your people. Yes, yeah, they will hear yeah, yeah. And thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was blessed seeing you again. I would like us to discuss vaccine. <laughs> I would like to hook up with yeah. you. Yes, I, I was so blessed to see you once again. I would like to hook up with you as a vaccine. So that we can chat sure. something. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. Anytime. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gezi and the IC team. ICT team, thank you so much. <laughs> you made it yeah, all possible. Yeah. Thank you yeah, yeah. very much. Rudolph, kudos. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, team. It's been wonderful. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Marie. Yeah, thank you, Marie. God bless. So, please greet your team, eh? all them, eh? Mark Williams and other people. If they are, if, and, uh, I think Adam, is he still there? Thank yeah, you all yeah, so yeah. very much. So, so very much. You can, you can catch your breath now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Gezi, where would the recordings be? Yeah, so we will do some little editing and we will share them. But I think some of you might have received links already to it, to them. Yeah, so hopefully in the coming days. Don't we have some on, on Facebook, Gezi? Yes, we do, because we did a live streaming. 
as okay. well as the on, on, on YouTube. Okay, so those those are available currently, right? Yes, uh, they should okay. be. Okay, God bless you all. Reverend Dr. Blazu, are you there? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I commented on you, but you did not respond. Today? Uh, on the chat, or? Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Uh, I just asked the question about the detectives. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was I was also putting it uh, to Professor Badiakut to help us know how the detectives work during research work. Uh, <laughs> if people who come from my background, detectives were dangerous people in my, my growing up. So when she was talking, my mind was always <laughs> on that. <laughs> when you are caught up as being a detective in research work, what happens to you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I think her explanation was okay, so that oh, you 